podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Hi, this is Leo Laporte, and this is my Tech Guy podcast. This show originally aired on the Premier Networks on Sunday, May 1st, 2022. Happy May Day. This is episode 1890. Enjoy. Tech Guy Podcast is brought to you by Melissa. Poor data quality can cost organizations an average of $15 million each year. Make sure your customer contact data is up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, and start playing in the API sandbox 24-7. Get started today with 1,000 records cleaned for free at melissa.com slash twit. And by Acronis. Keep your digital world safe from all threats with the only cyber protection solution that delivers a unique integration of data protection and cybersecurity all in one. Acronis Cyber Protect Home Office, formerly Acronis True Image. Go to go.acronis.com slash tech guy. Well, hey, 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 how are you? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater. Digital photography, we got your smartphones here, we got your smart watches there, we've got the augmented reality, the virtual reality, the real reality, we got all that stuff, Bitcoin, NFTs, all that stuff. ADA, anything with a chip in it, or I guess if you're talking the internet, Bitcoin, and NFTs, it doesn't have a chip in it, but it's chip derived. Anything chip derived, 8888 ask. Leo, the phone number, 888-827-5536. Busy day ahead. Today, Sam Abul Samad coming up. Our car guy, Chris Marquardt, our photo guy. We'll talk space with Rod Pyle. He brought something up last week I thought that was very interesting. The scientists who want to tell aliens where we are. Hey, over here. <laughs> and it's kind of controversial. Right? Two, two teams of astronomers are going to send messages into space to let aliens know that we're here. See, we've been listening for them for years, decades, really, uh, scanning the ether for radio signals from other planets. But we've never really made an attempt to contact them. So... Now we're going to do it. And, you know, the only thing that reassures me in this is it, it's space is big. It's really big. And there's very little chance that, in fact, whatever we sent out will uh, reach anybody uh, for any reason. So I'm not going to worry about it too much. But I got to say, I understand why people are saying, hey, really? Is that a, that doesn't, seems like maybe you shouldn't do that. <laughs> Maybe that's a bad idea. Uh, Rod will join us a little later on. We'll talk about that and other... There's lots of going on in the world of space these days. And at home, and at home, the city of Fort Worth has decided uh, now would be a good time to make a little extra money on the side. Uh, they, they're trying to think of what they could do. We could put a, a dog track in the basement, I guess. Have people bet. No, that's probably not good. So what they've done is they've put... They've built a Bitcoin mining <laughs> room with three Bitmain Antminer S9 mining rigs. It'll run 24 hours a day, seven days a week in the climate-controlled information technology wing of Fort Worth City Hall. Why not? Make a little money on the side. Uh, okay. I mean, honestly, with three rigs, there's not spending a lot of money. Uh and they're also not going to make a lot of money. They say it uses the same amount of energy as a household vacuum cleaner. <laughs> okay. There's a little too much, if you ask me, Bitcoin mania going on. I would just like to caution everyone once again <laughs> that uh, Bitcoins and NFTs and Web3, these are the buzzwords that uh, Silicon Valley wants you to sit up and pay attention to. Um. How can I say this? They're, they're speculative. It's like buying beanie babies, okay? Now, in the day, uh, 
you know, when people were buying Beanie Babies and putting them in the closet, no, don't open them, don't take the tags off. That was people saying, you know, someday these are going to be worth something. Have you ever done that? Put something aside and said, someday this She-Ra action figure, mint in the box, that's going to be worth something. So I'm putting that aside. When you're a kid, maybe your baseball cards, I'm going to put that aside. Uh, that's uh, fine. <laughs> Go ahead. Now, it'd be different if you then went out and spent thousands of dollars on Beanie Babies with the idea that someday this is your retirement fund. Because I, I, I'm guessing, but I, I may be wrong, but I'm thinking those Beanie Babies are now worth, worth less than you paid for them, even though they're mint in the box. That's called speculation. You're, you're, you're guessing, you're speculating that maybe the price will go up and you're going to make money. And that's what's going on with Bitcoin. And it does go up, but it also goes down. It's not tied to anything. You could make the argument that uh, like the stock market, most of the things we invest in, real estate, the stock market, are also speculative. They go up and they go down. They're kind of tied to something. You know, real estate is property. It's, you know, you can use it while you're waiting for it to go up. And mostly it kind of goes up. Stocks, you know, they're tied sort of to the fortunes of the companies they represent. And so when the companies do well, the stock goes up. But it's still kind of speculative. I understand that. Um, and which, and it doesn't stop me from putting money aside for my retirement. Nor should it stop you. But I'm maybe drawing the line at Bitcoin mining rigs in the basement of the Fort Worth City Hall. I'm just, <laughs> I just, I don't know. Get a, get a roulette wheel. Just get a roulette wheel. Invite some gamblers down. I my only my complaint is how hard it's being hyped, and I want to point out that if you are a speculator, let's say you bought a lot of Beanie Babies, it would be in your interest to go around saying how great Beanie Babies were, how the future was in Beanie Babies, and boy, these Beanie Babies are really going to worth be worth a lot of money someday, because if you do it well enough, people will come to you and say. Man, I got to get in on that Beanie Baby thing. Can you sell me some of your Beanie Babies? And you go, well, I don't know. I love these Beanie Babies. Okay. <sighs> oh, I could part with one for $10,000. Thank you. The people hyping it up stand to gain, as I guess what I'm saying. Just mentioning, just mentioning, mentioning that. Do you like video games? Do you know somebody who does? There are people who say video games are like our art, like a novel or a painting or a symphony, uh, a symphony, uh, you know, composition, a Beethoven symphony. They're art, and we should preserve them because really, that's a. If you think about it, these video games are tied to, you know, your old Atari video console, your Sega Genesis, and when that goes away, you can't play the video game anymore. So, Sony is building a game preservation team. A team that will try to preserve these works of art for future generations. This is like, you know, when uh, motion pictures started, people didn't think of them as art. They were commerce, you know, and they haven't really done a lot to preserve them, except in later years, we're starting to say, wait a minute, whoa, let's, you know, these early motion pictures, these are art. Sure, technology has gone beyond that, but this is, this is somebody's creation, and in many respects, are, are brilliant. Uh, we should preserve these. And so there's a great movement to preserve old film, which much of which was rotting away on film stock and warehouses and so forth. Same thing with video games. And in the past, it's been, um, you know, amateurs. It's been, been people like you and me, enthusiasts, trying to preserve these games, writing what we call emulators that would play these games on modern hardware, uh... And, of course, the companies that make the games are kind of, you know, trying to discourage that, calling it piracy. Um, I don't think it was piracy. I think it was preserving. You know who really is doing a good job? And I've got to give them a lot of praise. The Internet Archive. Do you know about the Internet Archive? Archive.org. guy named Bruce Kale sold his uh, startup company, Waze, many, many moons ago to AOL. That's how many moons ago it was. Made a little money. And said, I am going to retire and I'm going to devote my life to preserving the internet. Preserving uh, this stuff that we are creating online and 
in games and so forth. A lot, a nonprofit organization to preserve our history because it was, it's kind of, you know, a website goes down, it's gone, right? He has since preserved 681 billion web pages and more every day, all the time. But not just web pages, video games. You can even boot an, an old Macintosh computer if you go to archive.org. Uh, podcasts, music. In effect, he's preserving our culture. Culture that, when you're right in the middle of it, it's throwaway, it's disposable. Right? But as time goes by, you realize, no, we don't want to throw that out. That's, that's in many ways our history. Archive.org, if you haven't, don't do it now because you'll spend hours. Your, your life will... <laughs> 35 million books, 7.9 million films and videos. Yes, they're preserving old movies. 14 million audio things, you know, podcasts and stuff. 2.3 million TV shows. 839,000 games and other software programs. Millions of images, concerts. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Thank you, Brewster Kale, for doing that and everybody who works at the Archive. Uh, because it's a nonprofit. There's no money in this. They're not selling it. They're they're letting anybody uh, access it. And it's you you know if if you if if you were going to go on a desert island, and you only had one website to take with you, that's the one. It's effectively it's becoming like the Library of Congress, the the Archive. I mean, it's got everything from Canadian trade journals <laughs> to images from the Marshall Space Flight Center. It's awesome. To Donna the Buffalo, whatever that is. There's 1,013 items from Donna the Buffalo. <laughs> I think those are concerts. I don't know. <laughs> 8888 Ask Leo. Maybe someday one of my shows will be there. 8888 Ask Leo. The phone number. Website techguylabs.com. Let's get some uh, questions and answers and suggestions going. What do you say? Next. So Mud Duck, we uh, unfortunately when we built the brick house, you know, we took uh, we got quite a few, I think a th more than a thousand uh, donations uh, to help us build it, which was wonderful. And I thank you. And each of you got a brick. They were actually little facade bricks, little thin bricks. And unfortunately, uh, whenever our whatever our contract, I didn't have anything to do with it. I I absolved myself of all responsibility. Our contractor mortared them onto plasterboard throughout the hall. So uh, you can go back and look at uh, images. In fact, at one point, I think it's still on Google Maps, there was a 3D walkthrough where you could see all the bricks. But uh, they were mortared to the wall. So when we were forced to move, and then there's a story in itself I'll tell someday. When we were forced to move out of the brick house to this current studio, we took everything with us. All of the things that your money helped build Help, you know, basically made this happen. So none of that was lost. But many of the bricks were because uh, they were, when you take them off the wall, the whole wall comes with the brick. And, w you know, we investigated, well, what would it take to, uh, you know, with a wire whisk or something, get the plasterboard and mortar off of those bricks? And we did quite a few, but it would have cost much, much more money. Here's an example John is bringing me. This is pretty clean, actually. Um, so we took we took these with us, um, and so we could, you know, this is actually a pretty good one. Most of them come off with a whole huge chunk of wall. We have a sample. We're looking for it. So um, we saved a sample of these, a number of these. So, for instance, I think this one actually was never mortared on. So this is what they looked like originally. Yeah. This was never mortared on. This was just, uh, this is what some people got. If you ordered your brick, you could also order a, a f cheesy desk <laughs> ornament. But this is what the bricks ended up. I think this is, anyway, um, so we decided not to preserve them all <laughs> or re-mortar re them onto the new wall because I felt like, well, the same thing's going to happen. 
So that's essentially what happened to the BRICS. But don't think that your、uh, contribution wasn't greatly appreciated. It helped us build it. Now, let me tell you what happened to the Brick House. So, a company from San Diego called the Patio Company bought our, that whole building, and it was attached that building next door to a restaurant. And they told us, we're going to turn the restaurant into a brew pub, and we want to turn your space into the brewery.、Um, but until we do, we'd love you to stay for triple the rent. And、uh, to which we politely declined.、Um, they had been told by our landlord, oh, don't worry, Twit will never move out. <laughs> they spent too much money on the studio. They were right about that, made a quarter, one and a quarter million dollars on the studio. What he didn't understand is that studios are made to be moved, it's just a set. So, for instance, this whole thing behind me, I took, we took with us. Oops, we took with us. This desk, all of it was movable. So we took it and、uh, disappeared, decamped to our new place. And as you know, I think if you watch our shows from today, they look very similar because the set's the same.、Uh, I miss the old place. I loved it. And I felt bad that we had to move, but they, you know, they didn't give us much choice. Now it turns out, oh, it was a Ponzi scheme. The woman who ran the company is now in jail for $300 million in fraud. And the old studio is now owned by the federal government. It's in receivership. So I'm hoping we can buy it back for a dollar. That's, that's my plan. Give me a phone. <laughs> is this a teenager asking for a prince's phone in her room or? Oh. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know the song. Hello, Kim Schaffer, phone angel. Did you have a prince's phone when you were young? N-、um, not the prince's phone. I had the. The clear one that、oh. you can see all the inner workings. Ooh, fancy. And then it lit up when it, it lit、rang. up? Yeah. Yeah, it was just a clear princess phone. phone. Yeah. <laughs> did you have it in your、uh, room? I did. See, this is parents, be careful. Because <laughs> sometimes you give your kids something and then it becomes their career. And, and little <laughs> did your parents know that you would spend the rest of your life answering the phone. You know what's so funny? For radio shows. In my real life, I hate talking on the phone. Me too. Me too. Isn't that funny? I text back. Yeah, me too. <laughs> Me, isn't that so funny? I make very few phone calls, but、uh, all we do here is phone calls. Yeah. It's a little different this way, though. It is. I like talking to strangers, not people、yeah, I know. <laughs> exactly. We get to meet really interesting、exactly. people from all over the world. It's really kind of fun. So, who should we meet first? Well, let's go to Tom in LA.、Um, he wants to download some of his Instagram lives. And I gave him a suggestion off the air, which I think might actually work for him, but thought you might. Well, you better stay、way. on the line because I, I don't know what the answer is. <laughs> Honestly. Thank you, Kim. Hello, Tom. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hello, Leo. Long time listener. Thanks. Thanks.、Um, I have an archive of 30,000 photos. Uh, that I took when I was working on Everlos Raymond. And I started an Instagram site. And once a week, I do a live interview. And I cannot figure out how to download those approximately one hour interviews. I would,、um, I would frankly also save all those photos. What did you do on Everybody Loves Raymond?、Uh, I was a, a writer, producer. Nice. So, you've、yeah. got the history of. See, this is just what we were talking about the Internet Archive history behind the scenes. I love behind the scenes stuff of a, show, a much beloved TV show. So, I would try to save not only your, your reels and your stories, but I would try to save your、uh, images as well. Yeah, well, that, that's what motivated, motivated me. I started uploading them just to tell the story. So, it's all. Oh, so cool.、Photos. Yeah. What's, then, the, what's the Instagram account? Because I want to follow it. That's great.、Uh, Everybody loves Raymond 360.、Uh, perfect. What a great name. Awesome.、Uh, so there are, if you Google it, a million tools to download stories from Instagram.、Um, right. Well, these aren't stories. These are my. So every, actually, right after your show ends, I go live. Oh, uh, neat. And that's why I, I'm usually late for, because I'm listening to you up to the last. <laughs> Don't be late. <laughs> but, but I, yeah. So I'll do an interview、uh, show. I'll do、uh, alternating with a guest and not a guest. And that's an hour long. 
program. And so I thought, let me download it because I also want to make it, you know, do audio version only and also post it on YouTube. And I know wow. it's a different aspect ratio, but a lot of people that are you should totally show aren't aren't. Yeah, they aren't on Instagram necessarily. So well, it's, we've lost you know, some of them like Doris May Roberts and. It, yeah. It'd be wonderful to have some of that stuff uh, just forever. Um, yeah. Well, I, I, I will say this because I always had my camera and I was a writer. It's probably the most documented yeah. show in the history of TV. So. Yeah. What does Ray Romano think of the whole thing? Uh, Ray, uh, we are very close friends. So nice. He is, so he's supportive of this. You know. Uh, very much so, although he's not on Instagram or any social media, no matter how much I try. And he's keep. a wise, wise man. <laughs> 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 Nothing but hurt and pain follows. <laughs> um, good. So I, you know, this would be a great website, right? The Everybody Loves Raymond 360 right. website. Uh, this is a permanent archive. I think this is so important. Uh, I love this idea. So... Uh, yeah. So there are downloaders that will download your images, your stories. But how do you, so you're saying you do the interviews, but do you do them like as Instagram live? Yeah. I saw it ah. And then it doesn't give me the option to download no. for some reason. And I try to do just a screen recording, which is clunky and it never gets through the full hour on my iPad. <sighs> so, I don't know if there's a copy. It, it feels like there has to be some code that someone that I can just paste into a web browser or something. So you are doing this, streaming this live from your phone. Where are you streaming it from? From an, from an iPad. From an iPad. Instagram does not give you a way to save it. Their whole idea of this is it's uh, well, it's, you know it's evanescent. It's not it's not a permanent thing. It's just uh, you know. Um, but you can't, can you uh, tell me now, because I'm not an expert on this, can you, if you're in, on Instagram, can you see this after the fact or can you only watch it live? Uh, no, it saves it, but it's, it saves it, which is great, but it's only on Instagram. So right. I, I, you know, I want to, I want to be able to upload it to YouTube at a future date. So thank goodness it saves it. So there are downloaders. That's the most important thing. It saves it. So the next thing to do is to get a so and you pr you can do this on a, a computer because Instagram will let you if you're logged in go to that computer play back that video and then there are video downloaders you know there's some for Mozilla somebody's saying video download helper for Mozilla um, Instagram actually has a way to do it I think even official way let me see the chat rooms coming up with a, a bunch of ways to do this I really want you to do this this is this would be such a great thing to save. Um, let me yep. look at this Instagram help. Uh, it's at help.instagram.com. How do I save a live video on Instagram to my phone's camera roll? Yeah, that's as you're doing it. Hang on, I got to take a break. Sam Abul Samad, car guy coming up. I'll help you off the air. It says you've all, you're only able to save a live broadcast right after you've ended it. So at the end of your interview, you sh it's too late for previous ones, but for now, at the end of your interview, there's a button that says save it onto your camera, onto your... Yeah, and it, it doesn't, that doesn't show up, and I don't know why. Oh, that's weird. So that, yes. Maybe because they're so long? I don't when, know. When, when it's on Instagram, is the full interview there? They, sh they put the whole hour there? 100%. Oh, that's full great. Hour. I didn't know you yeah. could do that. I thought they were all short yeah. little really things. So we're well, the stories are short, but the inter the live can be long. Yeah, the, you know the story. Yeah, so it's. I, I just feel like there's something. There's got to be some code that. Yeah, yeah. This is it. Yeah, yeah. Instagram doesn't want doesn't make it easy, but there is that's exactly when you're on the web, for instance, on Instagram.com and looking at that video, and I presume you could play it back in your browser. It's downloading to your computer. It's just not saving it. So what you want is an application that in the background goes, yeah, I got it. I got that packet. Okay, I got that one. Okay, saving that one. Got them all. And at the end, has you have the whole thing. You will have to watch the whole video, but it will essentially record it. And, and it's just as, it's almost as if you were taking a video of it with your camera, but uh, you, you're, you're doing it, you know, digitally in the, in the computer. 
So uh, 4kdownload.com is is one that chat room is saying. Um, I think a lot of the YouTube downloaders will probably work as well. Uh, there's a, I've, we got a lot of links here from the chat room. There's a Mozilla, as I said, add-on called Video Download Helper. Um, Downey, D O. Are you in a Mac or a PC? I'm on a Mac. Yeah, Downey, D O W N I E, is the king of Mac downloaders. Let me see if it will do Instagram. D O W N I E. It's for YouTube, but I think you could give it any URL. Um, anyway, this 4K download sounds good, and this says specifically YouTube, but I think what it really is is, you know, you're playing video on the screen. In order to do that, the computer has to download the video packet by packet. The only difference is it doesn't save it. Here's another one, instadp.com. So there are quite a few of these. Okay. So you need one of these programs, and uh, you probably don't want to do it on the iPad. You want to do it on a, on a Mac. Right, 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 right. And uh, the and, latest MacBook Pro. So. Yeah, perfect. And it'll save. What are you working on these days? Uh, I do a, actually a children's educational program oh. called Mr. Mr. Clown TV. It's like a Muppets type. Awesome. That we do remote, yeah, remote, remote uh, zooms to classrooms around the world. Oh, how cool! Mr. Yeah. Clown yeah, TV. Mr. Clown TV. Yeah, we we took advantage of the downside of COVID, which is teachers had to adopt, you know, this global technology instantly of Zoom. Right. You know, well, I mean, you know, you know, but all of a sudden we were able to reach every classroom in the world versus having to go to. This looks class, great. And you know. this is your own thing? This, I am Mr. Clown. I am, I've been a puppeteer <laughs> forever, but I don't, I don't talk about that uh, in public. At least, yeah. <laughs> no one knows your name. It's okay. It's, no one knows. It's not as cool. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's not as cool. No, I'm not hiding it, but it's not as cool to say, and I have a clown puppet. Yeah, if you say I'm a puppeteer, I know people kind of act funny. I know, I know. Believe me. Yeah, it's yeah, not as good as a guitar. You know, I'm a rock star. Oh, and I have a clown yeah. puppet. Oh, and I have a clown puppet. Down. Exactly. Yeah. 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 <laughs> hey, Tom, what a pleasure talking to you. I really want you to do this. This is a... Just what I was talking about, you know? When these shows are on, people don't take it that seriously. You know, there's going to be fans who will videotape it and whatever. But you have all this stuff that never is aired that is a, a, a record of it. I think it's wor totally worth uh, yeah. putting on the yeah. web. Yeah. Hundred, I have hundreds of hours of behind-the-scenes <sighs> videos also. I'll, I'll email you, Leo, and let you know if it worked out. Would you? I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'll email yeah. back if it doesn't with some other ideas. Awesome. Thank you so much, Leo. My pleasure, Tom. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Our show today brought to you by Melissa. Hi, Melissa. Do you know Melissa? You ought to know Melissa. Melissa uh, is the address expert. Look, if you're in business, you have customer lists, supplier lists, you have address lists of all kinds. But those address lists are slowly going bad at a kind of surprising rate because people move names change phone numbers change if you still want to be in touch with your clients you need melissa poor data quality can cost organizations as much as 15 million dollars every year the longer bad quality data stays in your system the more losses you accumulate sending bills catalogs information to the wrong people that kind of thing. To ensure your business is successful, your customer information, it's just got to be accurate. Melissa is a leading provider of global data quality and address management solutions. Oh, and there's another side, by the way, to accurate customer data, customer service. If, if you address someone with the wrong name, you know, their maiden name, for instance, you know, or spell their name wrong, or maybe if you verify the wrong address and the customer's already frustrated and now you got the wrong address, things can go from bad to worse. So it's a terrible thing for customer service, too. Melissa is very handy in both cases. Verify addresses, emails, phone numbers, and names. You can even do it in real time. Melissa has an API you can add to your customer service software uh, or your shopping cart. They have uh, SaaS solutions that you can have running in real time. Their global address verification service verifies addresses for 240-plus countries and territories, and they do it at the point of entry, if you want. You can also, I mean, if you want, it's kind of key to Melissa's business model. You can have it on-prem. You can even take your customer list, upload it to their secure FTP server. They clean it, download it, 
in just a matter of minutes. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The other thing that Melissa does so well is get rid of duplicates. Duplicate information can hurt your bottom line. Melissa, data matching helps eliminate clutter and duplicates. It increases the accuracy of your database. You know, it's going to reduce. I used to get a very expensive catalog, three or four copies, the same name and address. Like the company was just like, well, they weren't using Melissa. So save money, save mailing costs, postage, save uh, printing costs. Melissa can do batch address cleaning, like I said. Uh, they also do identity verification. This can actually be very important for you to make sure that customer is the right customer. It could be a part of your compliance strategy, in fact. And, of course, it certainly helps with customer satisfaction. You can do geocoding. They can actually convert addresses into latitude and longitude. Email verification will help you remove 95% of bad email addresses from your database. Melissa has been doing this independently for 37 years. They are known by more than 10,000 businesses at the address experts. And by the way, nobody ever leaves Melissa. 92% retention rate. Partly, I think, because the ROI on Melissa it averages around 25%. Big year for Melissa last year. 30 billion, with a B, North American address lookups throughout the year. That's the most ever. So, oh, one more thing I know you're concerned about, privacy, security. Don't you worry. Melissa undergoes continuous independent security audits to reinforce their commitment to data security, privacy, and compliance. They're SOC 2, HIPAA, GDPR compliant. And get that service level contract. You're going to love it 24-7, world-renowned support, so you're never uh, at a loss. Make sure your customer contact's up to date. Try Melissa's APIs in the developer portal. It's easy to log on, sign up, start playing in the API sandbox. Melissa, M-E-L-I-S-S-A dot com slash twit. In fact, get started today with 1,000 records clean for free. Melissa dot com slash twit. Thank you, Melissa, for supporting the Tech Guy Show. Thank you for supporting us by using that address. Melissa dot com slash twit. It's time to talk automotive technology with Sam Abul Samet. He's the principal researcher at Guidehouse Insights. His uh, podcast, Wheel Bearings, is available everywhere podcasts are offered. And he joins us every week to talk about automotive technology. Sam, are you in a museum today? Where are you? Uh, no, that is uh, an image from uh, just over two years ago now, actually, when GM first announced uh, their Ultium EV platform. Um, this is and, the what uh, they call the skateboard for their uh, yeah. electric vehicles. Yep, this is the skateboard for the new generation of electric vehicles. So it's their new battery systems, their new motors, and also their new energy recovery system that they have. That's the regen for the brakes, kind of. Or? No, no. This actually is uh, something different. So the the the, break, the regenerative braking is one form of uh, energy recovery. That's recovering kinetic energy, and you know, if you remember back, uh, you know, to your science classes in high school, uh, you may remember the the term conservation of energy. Um, energy can neither be created nor destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So you can have kinetic energy, which is the energy you get from motion, to potential energy. So if you lift something up in the air, and then you know, then you have potential energy until you drop it, in which case then it gets converted to kinetic energy as it falls. You can have thermal energy, which is heat energy. Um, you can have light energy. You can have all, there's a lot of different forms of energy, um, and. Uh, so, uh, you know, all EVs and all hybrids have use kinetic energy recovery. That's regenerative braking because it's converting that um, kinetic energy of the, the vehicle's motion back into electrical energy that it stores in the battery that it can then use later to propel the vehicle. Well, um, the other, you know, I also mentioned thermal energy or heat energy. And that's uh, another form of energy that you can recover in an EV. And so uh, let me step back just a little bit to uh, internal combustion engines. Internal combustion engines, you have a bunch of energy in a liquid fuel that you burn. And it, in even the most efficient internal combustion engines, about 40% of the energy, the chemical energy that's in that fuel, gets converted into kinetic energy from motion. The rest is mostly wasted. You know, it goes into uh, mostly into heat energy. It's given off. You know, it's lost to friction. Uh, it's lost to the heat that in the in the coolant to keep the engine from melting down. Um, but 
that coolant, that heat, that energy that goes into the coolant actually does get used and can be can be useful. It's not completely wasted. Hmm. One of the ways that it's used is when it's cold out and you need to turn on the heat in, in the cabin of your vehicle. This is traditionally something that just kills your battery life on an electric vehicle. Right. With an internal combustion engine, you have that source of heat that you're giving off from the engine. It's normally waste. Right. You can run that through a heat exchanger, heat up the air in your cabin. No problem. So you're not you're not using any extra energy for that. But for a battery, you don't really have that source of heat, waste heat or not nearly as much. And so for EVs, what they've had to use up until now, for the most part, is what they call resistive heaters. So, uh, you know, this is basically taking energy, electrical energy from the battery, running it through essentially a giant resistor that heats up to heat the air that you then pump into your cabin. And so that takes away range from your EV when you're, uh, when you're driving, when it's cold. Um, and that's why, you know, one of the reasons why EVs get, you know, worse, uh, worse range yeah, in cold, cold weather. weather. They like you to use the seat warmer instead of the cabin warmer because yeah, it's a little it's, less. <laughs> it's, a, it's a more efficient way of keeping you comfortable in the, yeah, in the cabin. Yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> so there's an alternative, though. It's called a heat pump. Okay. And a, a well, I know about pump heat pumps in houses. Yeah. Well, same, same thing. Same idea, just on a smaller scale. So a heat pump takes uh, thermal energy from one source and transfers it to another source, hence the name heat pump. And for a house, when you're heating your house, it takes uh, some of the thermal energy that's in the air outside your house and heats up the air inside your house. Um, right. And it can also work in the reverse fashion. So right. if it's cold, if it's hot in, hot out, you can take the heat from inside your house and pump it outside. We've been meaning to put those cool. in the, uh, replace our furn old gas furnaces with those. Uh, yeah. Are they more efficient? They're way, way more efficient than any kind of, at least uh, down to a certain point, you know, and when it gets really, really cold, um, then they're, they're not as efficient because there's just not as much heat that you can get from the air. Uh, but for the most part, for most people, it's, it's a much more efficient solution than, than a furnace. Um, but they also work great in EVs. Interesting. And, um, because uh, what it can do is take some of that uh, heat, uh, some of the thermal energy that's in the atmosphere and basically condense it down and, and pump it into your uh, into your cabin. But there's also some sources, a little bit of heat that's generated in an EV, primarily in the motors and in the battery. And so a heat pump uh, can be used to transfer that energy around. And um, GM announced this week that on all their new EVs, all their Altium platform EVs, they're going to have a heat pump system as standard equipment on all of them. Uh, which they claim will give it about 10% more range, uh, so it'll make make it more efficient uh, when it's when it's colder out or when it's hot out. Um, and one of the interesting ways that they're using it is on the the Hummer EV, you know this this big hulking um, battery electric super truck that we've talked about a couple of times before. One of the features of the Hummer EV is something they call WTF mode, uh, which does not stand for what the, it's actually Watts to Freedom is, is their, their retro name. This sounds like Elon might have made that one up. Yeah, well, they're <laughs> inspired by Elon. And this is, this is the mode when you want to get 0 to 60 acceleration in three seconds with a 9,000-pound truck. And what it does is it uses the heat pump because to, to get maximum performance out of the electric motor, you want to cool down the motor, but at the same time, you also want to warm up the battery a little bit to get it to its peak uh, for uh, energy output to get it right, right, at, right at its optimum temperature. So what they do is they use the heat pump to draw heat from the electric motors, cool down the motors, <clears throat> pump that into the battery to precondition it to get it to the, the optimum temperature, and then you can get maximum acceleration. And similarly, uh, the Hummer is capable of charging on a DC fast charger at up to 350 kilowatts. And, but to do that, you, again, you have to have the battery at that optimum temperature. And so when you put in a charger as your destination uh, on the navigation system, it will, um, as you approach the charger, as you drive towards the charger, it will precondition the battery. It'll use the heat pump to charge it up without using a lot of energy from the battery itself to warm it up. So this is a really cool feature. Uh, and we're, we're starting to see this more and more on EVs. Traditionally, heat pumps have been a little more expensive than resistance heaters. 
But as they optimize them and design them, design systems specifically for EVs and remove some of the other uh, components, uh, they um, GM is claiming that this is about cost neutral with a traditional system. So it's about the same cost for the heat pump system on here as it is for the tra the resistance heater system that's on the Chevy Bolt that you have. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, so we're we're going to see this on more and more EVs going forward. GM is all in, aren't they, on uh, on electric vehicles? They uh, yeah, that's their plan. They even said in their quarterly uh, earnings report this past week that they were going to tie executive compensation to success in EVs. And I think that's one of the things they need to do to make sure that everybody's on board with the plan. Yeah, you get paid on how well our EVs are doing. Wow, and yeah. My wife is very happy. They announced an electric, uh, I'm blanking the name, Corvette? Corvette, yeah. <laughs> I'm intentionally blanking the name because I know it'll be very, very expensive. <laughs> it, 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 it won't be cheap, but, it, you know, I mean, compared to compared to some of the electric supercars out there, it'll probably be pretty reasonable. It'll probably be about around $100,000. She'd love a little uh, red which, electric Corvette. Oh, she'd be so happy. Yeah. That's probably coming about 2025. Perfect timing. Sam Abul Samad, Guidehouse Insights, Wheel Bearings is his podcast. You can find it at wheelbearings.media and wherever finer podcasts are distributed. And, of course, you find him each week right here. Thank you, Sam. You're welcome, Leo. Have a great week. Thank you. You too. Now, let me set you up for uh, your very own Sam Tasmic adventure in the cybersphere. All right, I only need to tomorrow morning. I'm flying to San Antonio uh, to drive the Ford F-150 Lightning. Oh, it's uh, it's finally official. Yeah, have you ever driven it before? Them to customers, I've ridden in it. I have not driven it. Oh, no, how fun. Nobody. Uh, except, except for uh, President Biden, uh, nobody, almost nobody outside of Ford has actually driven it. A lot of people have ridden shotgun along with the engineers, but this will be our first opportunity to to drive it and get you know get our hands on the wheel and and try it out and and see what it's it can exciting. really do. Yeah, it uh, should be really good. I was yeah. I was at the event at the uh, the Rouge Electric Vehicle Center on Tuesday when they celebrated the uh, uh, the the launch of production, even though they've actually been producing them for some time now. Um, they uh, had the, the official celebration for production launch, and they're starting to ship them this, this week uh, to customers. So in the, in the, the next few days, the first customers should be receiving their lightnings. Um, a friend of mine uh, who ordered one uh, got uh, his notification this week that his is going to be built in two weeks' time. Uh, so, oh, exciting. Um, so lightnings are, lightnings are getting out there to customers. Yeah. Yeah. I think Jerry just ordered one. I don't. I. I. I he asked me some oh, if questions. He, if he just. If he just ordered one, yeah, it'll then, be a year. Right? Um, yeah, like it could probably yeah. be sometime late next year before yeah. he gets it. Yeah. Um, they're they're scrambling to build as many as they can. One of the things that Jim Farley, the uh, Ford CEO, said uh, during the during his uh, presentation or during his speech, was that they've actually been prioritizing uh, allocations of chips and other components for the Lightning. Uh, so. Customers looking for gas engine F-150s might have to actually wait a little bit longer because they're they're making sure they can build as many Lightnings as they possibly can to meet the demand. Yeah. And uh, Web forty seven thirty three is asking an interesting question. He says, "Don't Teslas use heat pumps?" Teslas do use heat pumps. Uh, GM's not the first to use a heat pump. Uh, Tesla uses heat pumps. Uh, Volkswagen has used heat pumps on some of their EVs. Uh, the e-Golf a few years back had so a heat I pump So I had a system. heat pump on my Model yeah. X. I didn't even know it. Uh, the Model X did not have a heat oh. pump. The Model 3 and the Model Y do. <laughs> oh, I see. Uh, okay. your, your Model X didn't have a heat pump. The new, the new, the new refreshed ones, ones yeah. as well as the Model 3 and the Model Y, yeah. have a heat pump now. Yeah. Um, so they added that about a, they started installing those about a year and a half or so ago. Um, and one of the, one of the comments in here, uh, and I mentioned, you know, heat pumps work great down to a certain point when it's really, really cold. Oh, yeah. There's just not enough There's thermal not enough energy in the there. air yeah. to, to, to be useful. So for, if you live somewhere where it gets really cold, like for example, New England, uh, or here in Michigan, um, what you probably want for home heating is what they call a hybrid system where, uh, you would have a heat pump plus, um, you know, a smaller gas furnace. So the, the gas furnace kind of gets 
gets the temperature up to a certain point uh, or, or some, some other type of furnace. Not doesn't have to be gas. It can be whatever. But uh, a furnace plus a heat pump so that the, the furnace takes care of the, the really cold stuff. And then once it gets up to a certain point, then the heat pump can take over and get it up to you know, comfortable temperature. So if you live somewhere where it gets you know down to the single digits or sub-zero temperatures, um, that's uh, uh, that that's that's a, the solution to use. Uh, yeah, forty-seven thirty-three. Uh, it's it hasn't been standard on all Teslas, but I think in the last two and a half or three years they've made it standard uh, across the line. Um, uh, yeah, Twisted Mister. Yeah, the, I think yeah, the Model Three was the first one to get it, uh, and then uh, the Y, and then when last year when they launched the refreshed Model S and Model X, uh, they added a heat pump system on those vehicles. All right, uh, I'm going to put you on hold. Okay. Do you want to stick around for the top? Shaboom, shaboom. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, eighty-eight, eighty-eight. Ask Leo Perry on the line from Glendale, California. Our next call. Hi, hi, Perry. Hi, good afternoon, or I should say good morning. I'm looking at my notes here, and I'm thinking that I have a lot to unpack, but I'm going to use your expertise to, um, if, I, if I may say, periphrase, so to speak. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. Well, uh, <laughs> as, I, as I told your um, uh, confidant, Kim, I'm uh, for work, I am on uh, Chrome, and uh, I need to stay on Chrome because of our uh, company's database. And unfortunately, it keeps freezing. It freezes me out, and then I get the that that aw snap routine. And then oh, I, I hate that aw snap. And, I hate it when that it, happens. Yeah. I mean, it's it's that's really a tab annoying. crashing, is what that is. Uh, and you get that a lot on any particular page. Is it your company's database that gets that, or what's getting that? You no. Know, the funny part is it's a database is fine. I can glide through that okay, all good. day long. Okay. And when I go on to, um, so I've done my due diligence and I've been for two weeks and I've been trying. That's why I finally come to you, sir. And the funny thing is, is that I go through all the steps. Five, you know, I've found like maybe six different ways to, to get to the same thing, to unload these these uh, temporary uh, internet files and it they keep coming back and then I freeze and then unfortunately there's one at the at the um, so you're do uh, you're main, doing you're doing that I'm because sorry. you think that's going to fix the off snap is that why you're doing that well, the, well, right I'm thinking that I'm so here's Google that. here's what Google says yes yeah. uh, and maybe you've seen this page I'll put it in the show notes there's a fix off snap page crashes on Google. And they do say, you know, first check your internet connection. Duh. Okay. I'm sure it's fine. Then they do say clear your cache. And they talk about opening the page in an incognito window and then clearing cache and cookies. That is, so Ossnap simply means a page crashed, that tab crashed. And so there's Lots of reasons a tab could crash. Um, mm -hmm. Loading in some spurious content from a cache is what you're trying to fix. Uh, and that may or may not fix it. I got to say, that may or may not fix it. Uh, it also could be that you don't have enough RAM or that there, and this is possible, that the page itself has a bug. So if it's always the same pages as Snap, then those pages might be bugged. So you say when you clear the cache, there's something left over? Fourteen point three. That's the same number I see over and over and over again, and it's it, it's the, it won't go away. And that's the name of the file. No, forgive me. I'm sorry. Fourteen point three megabytes is oh. what's left over. Oh, and and I can't I can't dump it. Okay. And so and and I have my uh, Bellark advisor. You'd be proud of me. I have my Bellark <laughs> uh, advisor printout. <laughs> that's very old school. Those are the good old days. Yeah, no, no, you don't need that. No, let's not go crazy here, okay? Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, you can't, so there's a few things you should try. Uh, if it's always the same pages, it could just be the pages that are at fault. But it could be their cache. If if it's a variety of different pages, how much RAM do you have in your your machine? Uh, let's see. Uh, going over Is it a 16? Look at Bellark. Is it a 16 gig machine? Uh, let's yeah. Um, no, it's eight. Eight. So that's a little low. And Chrome, as you may or may not know, is a pig. And so eats, eats, 
give me more RAM. I want more RAM. So if it runs out of memory, and some pages, you know, uh, Chrome lately has gotten more aggressive about, and you may have seen this message, killing a page if it's using up a lot of memory. Uh, but if a page has a memory leak or uses up a lot of memory, this happens a lot. Uh, you may be running out, and that may be the cause of the oh snap. So in other words, it could be more than this 14 megs left over. I would try this. This is the next step beyond what you just did, which is resetting Chrome to its default. That is going to clobber everything, and it should clobber those 14 megs. Okay? Okay. That is, okay. That is in the advanced right. settings um, on your Chrome. There's something called reset and clean up. Now, before you do that, if your bookmarks are important, I would export those, save them, because you can then import them again after the cleanup, because it's oh, going to delete. Okay. It's it's going to take it back to everything that it was like when you first installed Chrome. But that's what you kind of want. The other thing you should look at is extensions uh, that you have installed. If you have a custom theme, that could be the problem. And the final <laughs> thing is to remember that Chrome isn't the only version of Chrome out there. Google's Chrome is based on an open source project called Chromium, and there are, that's what your company's database requires. That's the rendering engine that Chrome uses. And there are many other programs that do it. If you're on Windows, Microsoft's Edge also uses Chrome. It's using Chromium. So it will work the same as Chrome on your company database. So will Vivaldi. Uh -huh. So will Brave. So will a number of third-party browsers. In fact, most third-party browsers now, because it's open source, just say, yeah, we're going to take the Chromium rendering engine. That's the thing that actually draws the page. That's what your database needs. And, and then on top of it, put our own user interface, maybe have better privacy protections, you know, de-Google it, things like that. So first thing I would do, Let's go through the steps. You did the first thing I would have said, which is clear the cache didn't help. Next thing, do reset Chrome. Don't forget to back up your bookmarks first because you're going to mm -hmm. lose everything. Tabs, uh, default search engine, default home page, all of it basically takes it back to the beginning. If that doesn't work, completely uninstall Chrome. Are you on Windows? Yes. Yeah. And, and I've done, I've, I've done, uh, I've taken it out. And then I put it back in, and it still still had the issues. And I'm looking at my Bell Arc, and I only have four megs. It looks like I have. Now uh, wait a minute. Hold on. You only have four megs left on your whole hard drive. No, it, it says it says slot channel A and channel B, twenty four two thousand forty eight times two. So that's telling me that I have four megs in there. Oh, not eight megs. Yeah, four right. megs. Four megs is very light. Is it a Chromebook or is it a uh, it's a Windows machine? Oh, oh, yeah, it's a Windows machine. Oh my gosh, how old is it? Uh, okay, promise not to laugh. No, I'm not laughing. Uh, my my, <laughs> my friend built it for me in 2014. Yeah, so four gigs even Click. then was kind of lightweight. Um, uh, if that's really all you have. There's another way to see, which is just get about Windows and see. But uh, if that's all you have, then that could also be one of the sources of this. But at least we can try to clean up Chrome, you know, okay. restart Chrome. Try using Edge, which is the browser. Are you using Windows 10? Yes, yeah. so professional. Yeah, so 10 comes with Edge. Uh, if you don't have it, you can get it from the Windows Store. Try that. Uh, it might be a little better. It's going to be very hard to run Chrome in 4 gigs of RAM. That's yeah, going to well, be tough. It says, it, it says 2048, 2048. So I'm I don't know. if. Uh, yeah, I mean, look at, do the, you know, in Windows there's, you know, you can go to about Windows and it'll say how much RAM you have. If it's really four gigs, <laughs> you know, one of the things you might want to do, you probably, is it a laptop or desktop? It's, it's desktop. Desktop, right? But you can go out and buy more RAM for it. And RAM's cheap. I would get you up to 16 gigs. That might just solve the whole old snap. Chrome might be saying, oh, snap, this guy only has four gigs of RAM. Snap! That's Isn't light. It's funny that I've had this thing for so long and I've never had a problem. Well, yeah, because everything's getting bigger. Because every, yeah, They expect everybody to have eight gigs minimum now. And oh, okay. So everything's getting bigger and fatter. This is a bad trend. Remember, we in DOS, we used to have 64K. <laughs> <laughs> and everything fit. 
But because that's all you had, so they wrote programs to fit that. But now that everybody has, you know, 8 gigs, 16 gigs or more, when I buy a new machine, I don't buy anything less than 16 gigs. If I'm going to get into the solution, okay, done and done. If I wanted to rebuild my, my system doing a, you know, uh, doing memory. I wouldn't rebuild it. Yeah, I mean, the two things you can do, I wouldn't rebuild it, but two things you could do are add some more memory and put an SSD, a solid-state drive in there. Both will make huge differences. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It's 20, if it's really 2014, um, it probably has a fairly recent processor in it. What does Bell Arc say on the processor? Uh, let's see. Thank, thank you for staying on. Oh, yeah, of course. Um, I have to go pretty soon because Sam's thing. here, but go ahead. Okay, very quickly, um, and I did mention this to Kim or yourself, that the fan on the processor, processor seems to be humming. It does the... <laughs> you know what? You know what? Do you have a little... Do you have a thousand bucks you could spend on a new computer? <laughs> 2014 is not that old. Honestly, it's not that old. But it sounds like uh, you either need to replace the fan... It's it's been it's laboring, um, and so I I think you you know you could bring it to somebody she's tired. and she's tired. Yeah, she's, she's tired. tired. Okay, all right. Because you because you if it one. were me if it were me if you felt pretty handy with the whole thing, replacing the fan you probably want to repaste the processor. There's thermal paste between it and the cooling thing. So when you take the fan off, you replace the, you redo the paste. You'll need to watch a video or two on that because it has to be done just right. Uh, you will want to replace the spinning hard drive with a solid state drive. That's going to make a huge performance improvement. And then... Oh, it, it is, it is, forgive me, Leo, it is a solid state. Oh, good, all right. Samsung, yeah. So, okay, and, and it's very, it's very small. So that's probably what I need to do is just get back, get into the 20th, 21st century. Go to Dell, you know, get a get a desktop from Dell. They're cheap. You can use the same keyboard, mouse, and monitor. You probably spend mm -hmm. 600 to 800 bucks, uh, and it would be 10 times faster. And you, I don't think... Now, watch this. You'll do all that, and oh, snap! <laughs> so, oh, no, so, no, no, right. No, you, you, you make me laugh. It's funny. No, you, you, give me a brand, because when I was going through Dell, Dell ready to dump the thing, yeah. then I saw these different you know, model tiers and which one, because I want to have one that's, it'll last me for five years. Um, so yeah, Dell does it based kind of like uh, they have the consumer and then the, the work and then the professional and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, they've have for home and for business, the least expensive ones uh, when it comes to PCs, I think are the Inspirons. Um, they're, they're quite good. If you want the fancier Dells, the XPS is their kind of premium line. They're very good. But just get an Inspiron. You get a nice Inspiron desktop with a 10th uh, or 11th generation. Actually, they're now selling, selling with 12th gen Intel processors. Get an i5. Get 16 gigs of RAM. Get a terabyte hard drive. You're probably talking seven or 800 bucks. Inspiron. I-N-S-P-I-R-O-N. I five and sixteen megs and oh okay you're you're a lifesaver I'm gonna do that because if if I and I know you got to go if I was gonna get a new one I would end up putting the old one in the closet with my last one the nice so, yeah you're gonna have a nice little collection in the back there <laughs> yeah, uh, sure. the nice thing is you can connect the old computer to the new one copy all the data over so you won't have to start over from scratch get the boss to buy it he's making you use their silly da database. Oh, I love it. Yeah, I do. <laughs> I'll drop your name at the next meeting. Tell, tell you, boss, Leo said you owe me a computer, dude. Oh, I love it. You're getting a Dell. All right. Uh -oh. I got to run. Thank you, Thank you sir. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. All right, Sam. Sorry about that. Eating up your no time. Worries. But I wanted to help that poor fellow. Yep. All yours, friend. All right. Uh, all right, so uh, I can't remember who it was now. Somebody was asking about uh, a replacement for a van for camping. Uh, he's currently got a, an old Grand Caravan. Um, yeah, there's some actu actually some really good choices. And if you're looking right now uh, at a replacement, um, then I would suggest either uh, the Toyota Sienna, uh, which is standard now. Uh, the new Sienna launched last year is standard with hybrid powertrain. Uh, it's about 34, 35 miles per gallon, 
or the uh, Chrysler Pacifica plug-in hybrid, uh, which uh, is great for around town. You get about 33, 34 miles of all-electric range. You can do most of your daily driving without using any gas at all. And then uh, when you want to take a road trip and go camping, whatever, you can still uh, keep right on driving and use it just as a regular hybrid uh, and still gets uh, mileage in the in the 30s. So um, that those would probably be your best choices. If you were willing to wait until about 2024, um, then I would suggest the VW ID Buzz, uh, which is coming in 24 to the U.S. market, uh, and that's going to be all electric. Uh, so that one would be a great choice as well. Um, let's see. Uh, Tech Dino is asking, uh, did, did I hear you correctly? More range in EVs. Um, I, I assume you're referring Tech Dino to the uh, with uh, with a heat pump system. Yes, uh, you do get more range with a heat pump system uh, because the the traditional climate control system, uh, the resistance heater is just using energy from your battery and running it through a giant resistor to create heat, to heat the air. Uh, and then for the air conditioning system, uh, it works much like a traditional air, con air conditioning system, except because you don't have an engine um, to uh, turn uh, pulley for, to drive the compressor, uh, you are using an electric motor to drive the compressor. And so a heat pump system eliminates um, a lot of that and makes the whole thing more efficient. Um, Let's see. Well, uh, somebody else was talking about uh, battery hybrids being a better solution than than batteries. Um, you know, it depends on your use case. You know, one of back going back uh, over 15 years ago now, um, when I first started writing for Autoblog, I wrote um, wrote a, an opinion piece back then in, in the fall of 2006 uh, that uh, you know this was the end of the energy monoculture for transportation uh, and. My premise there was that, you know, for the past century, you know, we've relied almost entirely on petroleum as our energy source for transportation. And going forward, that's no longer going to be the case. There is not a silver bullet. Uh, I was actually just doing a webinar yesterday for – or Saturday, Friday for a client uh, on a study that we did at work on, um, uh, you know, best uh, decarbonization for commercial fleets. And the, the reality is that, you know, electric is not necessarily the best solution for every application, or at least battery electric is not necessarily the best solution. It is a great solution for probably the most number of applications, but not for everything. Um, you know, batteries are big, heavy, but they're not great for long haul trucking, for example, because they are so big and heavy and they take time to charge. Uh, so ideally what you want there is something that can refuel quickly so you have minimal downtime for, for the trucks and can go a long distance. And that's where hydrogen fuel cells are really great for that. Hybrids are also a great solution for a lot of people today, especially if you live in an area where there's uh, – where either you don't um, – if you don't have access to off-street parking and your own charging or you live you know, in a more rural area where <clears throat> you don't have um, – uh, a whole lot of public charging infrastructure. Um, hybrids are a great solution. Uh, they get you, you know, some a lot of the benefits of electrification, um, but you know, you're you're not limited by where you can charge. You can you can still drive anywhere, and so I I would not rule out a hybrid for anyone. Uh, you know, they're also still generally significantly more affordable than most equivalent battery electric vehicles. Um, so it might, it may well be the better solution for you right now. A few years from now, that may or may not be the case. We'll see how battery technology continues to, to evolve. Um, but, uh, it, you know, hybrids are still a great solution right now. Uh, let's see what else we got here. Um, yeah, Tim, uh, Tim Stevens, uh, from CNET, uh, who's writing about, uh, his drive of the Lucid Air, um. Uh, I, I got a chance to drive the, the Lucid uh, about a month and a half ago. Uh, I had a fairly short drive. I'm looking forward to a longer drive with it soon. Uh, but the, the current top-end versions of the Lucid Air uh, do have a range of over 500 miles. Uh, and they do it with a, a relatively modest battery size, uh, less than half the size of the battery in the uh, the GMC Hummer, uh, because uh, Lucid and their CEO Peter Rawlinson, who's also their CTO, has put a lot of focus on energy efficiency, getting the uh, you know minimizing the losses throughout the system, 
to get the most possible efficiency out of every kilowatt hour of energy you've got stored in the batteries. Uh, when you do that, you can um, ha still have significant range with a smaller, lighter battery pack that's going to be less expensive. So uh, it's there, there's a there's a lot of um, good work being done out there to make uh, EVs more efficient and more affordable for everybody. Sam, you're wonderful. You're a wonderful fella. I thank you for your time. And I, I wish you, you a wonderful week in beautiful downtown Ypsilanti. All right. I will See talk ya. to you next Sunday. Thanks, sir. Bye-bye. Well, hey, hey, hey. How are you today? Leo Laporte here, the tech guy. Time to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888. Ask Leo is the phone number. If you have a question, a comment, a suggestion, you'd like to talk high-tech with me, I'd love to talk high-tech with you. 888-827-5536. Toll-free from anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. Outside that area, you can still reach me, but you'd have to use Skype or something like that. 8888-ASK-LEO. We put links in the show notes to help our callers techguylabs.com that's free there's no sign up the links are there after a couple of days after the show we'll put all of the music links up from professor laura our musical director there'll be audio from the show there'll be video from the show there'll even be a, a transcript as i said it takes a couple of days but uh, that transcript's helpful you can search it find what you want there's time codes jump to that part of the show so all of that is there free techguylabs.com just go to episode 1890 for may day 2022. That's today. So I talked a little more with our uh, caller off the air uh, afterwards and decided probably the best thing to do. He had a very light memory footprint. He says four gigabytes uh, in this old PC a friend had built for him and was having trouble getting Chrome to run in four gigabytes. I think nowadays uh, you'll still see computers sold with eight gigabytes. Nobody sells anything with four. And if they do, <laughs> run. <laughs> no, you don't want that. Eight I guess uh, if it's Windows, uh, maybe Mac, you could probably do that. A Chromebook, of course, 4 is okay, uh, but not on a, on a Windows or a Mac. I would go with 16. So he said, what should I get? And I'm just looking at Dell. Uh, I just bought a Dell laptop, but he wants a desktop. The Inspirons are fairly inexpensive. Dell is now selling, I think they're one of the first to do this, the new Intel Alder Lake chips, the 12th generation Intel's, and that's why I bought a, a Dell laptop. It won't come for a couple of months. <laughs> uh, looks like the desktops come a little faster, but the laptop's not going to come for a couple of months, uh, which I'm disappointed because I wanted to take a look at these new Intel chips. The early uh, testing, early reports say that Intel has done a very good job with these 12th generation chips. They're copying a little bit what ARM and Apple have been doing with their chips. As you might know, nowadays, uh, in the early days of computing, one chip, one core, one processor did it all. <laughs> that, that was it. Single core. Then Intel came out with the duos. Remember those two, two process, two in one chip. And uh, the reason was they couldn't get the clock speeds any faster. For a long time, it was like, oh, you know, your first IBM PC was 4.77 megahertz. That was the clock speed. That meant it could do roughly that many 4 million operations a second. Some of the things, addition and subtraction, might take multiple operations. But roughly, you know, 4.77 million operations per second. And as each computer came out every year, it'd be, you know, faster. Then there was 10 megahertz. 90, I remember the first 90 megahertz computer I got. Oh, we were excited about that. That would have been roughly 1993, 94. We were so excited about that. I remember playing with it saying, it feels slippery. It's so fast. <laughs> A 90 megahertz computer. Then we got it, you know, faster and faster. Eventually, we got to 1 gigahertz, 2 gigahertz, 3 gigahertz. That's 3 billion operations a second. But then Intel hit a wall. About 4 gigahertz for a variety of reasons, mostly to do with physics. They couldn't get any much faster. 
engine at 5 gigahertz range, but that, yeah, it gets a little unreliable as you get faster and faster. It gets There's heat problems. There's issues. Mostly it's reliability issues. So Intel said, what are we going to do? Because the world's expecting us to get faster and double every couple of years. What are we going to do? Well, they came up with a solution, uh, which was put two in. <laughs> So if one 3 gigahertz processor is fast, two should be twice as fast. No, nah, wait, hold on. It isn't. Because most of the programs you use, even to this day, don't divide the work up into, say, you do this, you do this, you do this, you do this. The, the multi-processing, they don't do that. They're all single-threaded. A thread is one thing. They're doing one thing at a time. So the... Base clock speed, 3 or 4 gigahertz, is actually the speed of the computer for most things. Running Windows, browsing, email, it's not using multiple processors. It's only when you get into editing photos and video and, you know, fancy stuff that you really need multiple processors. Nevertheless, it's good marketing. Intel said, dual core, duo, two. Twice as good. No, but sold a lot of computers. So then they did quad <laughs> and eight and on and on and on. So their current uh, Intel Alder Lake, depending on which one you get, has four cores, six cores. If you get an i7, it's got 12 cores. That's 12 processors all running at around four, somewhere between two and five gigahertz. It's clock speed. It changes. And again, that's for efficiency. So when you're not doing a lot, it slows down. Most of the time, you're still only using one. If you look at a... Uh, you know, you you have a, a, a CPU meter. You can see the CPU's working. You look at your activity monitor, uh, and you can see the CPU's working. And most of the time, only one's doing anything. The rest of them going, yeah, well, whenever you need me. So one of the things Intel's done uh, in following in uh, the footsteps of ARM and Apple, both of whom are looking for more efficient, lower power processing, is add what they call efficiency cores. So now instead of 12 cores all running at the same speed, they've got maybe eight, if eight power cores, high speed cores, and four efficiency cores. And the efficiency cores, which use less power, are running most of the time. And then when you need it, we get the big cores, which is most of the time never. You get the big cores. And of course, they use more power. So all of this is to save power, save heat, make the machine uh, run uh, as well without using as much juice. And that's what these new 12th generation processors, for the first time, that, to my knowledge, from Intel are going to do. They're going to have efficiency cores. Your iPhone has had that for years. Your Android phone has had that for years. But now Intel's doing it. Uh, so this will be, uh, I, I'm very interested in how they do this and, and how well it does it. This is Intel's response to Apple's M1. Qualcomm said this week in their quarterly uh, earnings call that they too were going to use a new technology to try to make chips that are as efficient as Apple. Apple's really driven the market there. M1s are so efficient. They use so little power. If you get one of the new Macs based on the M1 chips, the fans never come on. I mean, actually, they're on all the time, but they're on very low and you hardly hear them. In fact, unless you put your ear to the computer, I don't think you hear them at all. I have a Mac Studio. I got my wife the top of the line Mac Studio with a Max, the M1 Max processor, and uh, then gave it a really challenging problem, something called photogrammetry, really hard problem. All 12 of the process of the cores are pegged all the way, 100%, all of them running like crazy, working hard, nothing, dead silent, no fans, nothing. Just very quiet. There is a little, actually, it's not fair to say no fans. The fan's always running, but it doesn't get faster. It doesn't get hotter. And so that's what Intel's saying. Hey, maybe we could do that. That's where the world's uh, going. So, should you care? No, because most of the time you're only using one core. <laughs> but I'm going to get one. Uh, I guess if you get a new computer, you probably should look at the 12th generation because they should be lower power, more efficient, and have some headroom, which is kind of what you want when you're really doing something you need. And surprisingly, there are things you do, maybe browsing the net with a lot of graphics and things, do need a lot of processor. If it needs it, it can kick it in and then back it down as it needs to be.
8888 ask Leah. We're going to go back to the phones in just a second. Chris Marquardt's coming up in about 15 minutes. He's our photo guy. Lots to come. But I thought I should explain what's uh, going on. Modern PCs. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Ultra, you're right. She's got the Ultra. What was I saying? Hi, Chris. Hello. How are you, How are you today? Good. Moin, moin. Things I'm going moin, well. Moin. I'm actually, actually, I spent uh, the entire week up, up north where they all say moin, moin all the time. I knew that. That's why I said it. No, I didn't. <laughs> so we are going back to Bavaria for Christmas 2023. Not this year, but next year. Ooh. We're going to do a um, Passau to Budapest River cruise. And we're going to spend Christmas oh, Eve. Danube River. Yeah, the Danube. Uh, we're going to spend nice. Christmas Eve in uh, Regensburg and Christmas wow, Day. And we're going to spend New Year's Eve and New Year's Day in Vienna. I'm very excited. It's going to be a lot of fun. Do you know what hotel in Regensburg you're in? No, we're in a boat. <laughs> oh, you're on the boat. We're on the boat. So uh, is there a really nice one there? Oh yes, that's really, where the really, really old one. that's where it's I went Orpheum. to Orpheum. The Orpheum, okay. O O R P H E E. It's it's Orpheum. a must stay. Oh, well, I think we start. I don't know. Maybe, no, we start in Passau, so I won't be able to do that. Ah, okay. Um, that's where I think the oldest restaurant in the world was that I had those wonderful sausages and some that's very good beer. Possible, yeah. yeah the, so I think we'll go back there. <laughs> yep. That's cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, we decided too. it's time this, to this, start traveling again. It's a lovely, in it's a, a lovely year part of Germany. And a half. Yeah, we really enjoyed it. We did that in 2015, and it was so nice. Yeah. We thought, oh, we're gonna, gonna go back. Anyway, I'll be with you in about 10 minutes. I'm here. Do you have an email to me? Should I look for? Yes, I do. I'll do the driving. I'll do the showing. Okay. But you can back me up. Jazzy, jazzy. Woo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888-ASK-LEO. Joe's on the line from Marlboro, New Jersey. Thanks for hanging on, Joe. Hi, Leo. Uh, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, my, my question for you is um, someone I ran into said he would give me a couple of video cameras. Nice. that he picked at, at swap meets or, oh. uh, you know. He okay. picked them up very cheaply. He said they were about twenty dollars a piece because they do have HDMI out, but the uh, memory cards don't work in the, in oh. the you know. Who cares, right? If you're going to use li use them for live recording, live streaming, right? And what I wanted to know is there some way to pipe HDMI into uh, a MacBook Pro? Sure. Sure. So despite the fact that many computers have HDMI ports on them, almost all cases, those are outbound ports for connecting to a monitor as opposed to an inbound port to connect into the computer. But there are plenty of ways to get HDMI video into a computer. There is something you should... Now, you already bought them? You already bought them. Yeah. Yeah. There's, some, there's something you should check before you get all excited about this. Look up this camera model and see if it can do something called clean HDMI. Okay. So cameras that have HDMI out uh, sometimes put all of the stuff you see on the viewfinder, <laughs> like the battery level, the date, the time, all that stuff, they put that on the HDMI. Mm -hmm. And you don't want that. So you need to know if it has an, a setting in the settings for clean HDMI. If you look up those cameras online, you will absolutely find out if it has HDMI that's clean. Otherwise, it's not useful. And there are a surprisingly large number of cameras that do not do that. I don't know why. Uh, maybe they don't expect people to be streaming directly out of it. So that's the first thing to make sure you can get clean HDMI. And then to get into your MacBook, do you want to you use multiple cameras? Uh, well, here's the thing. Um, he he said he'd give me, he says, as far as he's concerned, he threw at them. He's been piping them into his uh, windows. He's got a couple of windows um, towers, and he uses um, capture boards from uh, your favorite place. So you don't need a capture board because that's what a capture board does is convert 
analog to digital. You already got digital. All you need is an HDMI to Thunderbolt adapter. So the simplest thing would be to go to Apple and buy, they sell them, uh, an HDMI. It's got HDMI on one end, Thunderbolt on the other, and make sure it's for connecting to a camera. Because mm -hmm. the HDMI port on the MacBook, some of them have HDMI now, is out only, outbound only. So you want an inbound. But you don't need to do anything. You just need to convert the HDMI coming out of the camera to Thunderbolt because it's all digital. You don't need to capture anything. It's already bits. Okay. The reason I asked you if you want to use all the cameras is, in that case, <clears throat> I would recommend getting an inexpensive switcher. Blackmagic, for a couple of hundred bucks, makes the ATEM, A-T-E-M Mini. It's from blackmagicdesigns.com. And the ATEM Mini will take four HDMIs and then has one out, a Thunderbolt outbound that goes to your your computer and it's a switcher, just like uh, like the big boys use on TV. So you can say camera one, ready camera two, camera two, ready camera three, camera three. You get up to four cameras on the ATEM Mini. So if you wanted to use them all at once, instead of just a single shot, if you wanted to have a single plus a, uh, you know, a wide shot plus a two shot plus a close up, you could do all of that. Okay. So there's two ways to do it, but either way, all you need is to convert that HDMI to Thunderbolt. All right. This might be in keeping with it. Uh, my daughter just gave me, I think it's a monitor, because on it it says uh, TCI in, but it might be a Samsung, full Samsung TV. I'm running a second monitor off my MacBook. Is it possible to run another monitor off this MacBook? It depends on the MacBook. Most of them, yes. Which MacBook do you have? All right. It's late 2013. Yeah. It does run. Um, the, the current version of well, whatever the big Sur is 11.6.5. It won't go past that though. With the current Mac OS is Monterey, but that's all right. You're at, you're at Big Sur, uh, and you want to use multiple monitors. Right. Uh, absolutely, should be no problem at all. Of course, you're going to have to somehow get the connectors. There's an HDMI port on that Mac, I think. Yes. Yeah, I'm running a second monitor. Off yeah, and, and then. And then you're going to take, uh, so you're already running a second monitor, but you could run, I believe on that one, you can run another monitor, but you need to either get uh, a Thunderbolt out. I don't know if you have Thunderbolt on 2013. Yeah, Thunderbolt ports. Okay. It's what, it, what you really want is display port, mini display port. So you have a display port, you connect that into a monitor. You'll need a monitor that supports display port. All right. Now, I see two... Thunderbolt ports on here. I don't see any mini display ports. Yeah, Thunderbolt carries video. Mm -hmm. So it's just a Thunderbolt 2 mini display port. Or actually, in your, it depends on the monitor you get. The maxi display right. port. It's up to you. Yeah. Is, is there such a thing as a Thunderbolt 2 uh, dock that you can buy? Sure. Go to, go to Other World Computing. They're at maxsales.com. In fact, everything you want... To do all of this can be bought at Other World Computing for the most part. They specialize in Mac stuff. Not a sponsor, but I always get stuff from them. And they sell Thunderbolt 2 docks, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just one additional thing, Leo. You're always saying when someone says something, gee, I'm so jealous. Uh, <laughs> you want to make me jealous? Is that what you want to do? What do you got? I ran into a guy uh, in the uh, in, in Costco, and he said that his car that he just bought, yeah, he had, he's shipping it to Liverpool, England, and he's going to spend the next six months in in Europe driving his car, and he oh. says it it's a money saver because it's about sure. dollars a day to rent a car in Absolutely. Europe. Absolutely. You drive it around all over the place. You go see where the Beatles started. It's going to be great fun. Well, he, he's going go to, to Scotland. Go, go to Ireland. <laughs> go to England. <laughs> Get on the ferry boat. Go to France. Oh, yeah, that's the way to do it. When we were kids, when I was a kid in 1967, uh, we bought a Volkswagen and went to Germany from the United States, took a boat, took the SS United States to Germany and picked up the Volkswagen, drove all around Europe for a summer. And then we put it on the Queen Mary and sailed it home. All right. That, that's what this guy is going to do, except this is the second time he's done this. The first time he said he went to a car show, someone expressed interest in this 
Mustang, 66 oh. Mustang. Oh. He sold it, made a profit, and paid for all of the Now money. I am jealous. <laughs> right. See, I should have kept that 66 Mustang. Darn it. He's he's doing the same thing again. I, I It's one of my dreams, except that my wife would never put up for six months here's, in Europe. Here's my dream. We're going to go to the Wolfsburg plant. We're going to pick up Volkswagen's new ID Buzz Volkswagen camper. We're going to drive it all around Europe. Then we're going to get it on a boat and take it home. How about that? That's a, that's a dream. I like to dream. Pleasure talking to you. You did make me jealous, Joe. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Camera guy, Chris Marquardt, coming up. <laughs> I'm liking that buzz. It's so cute. But I'm going to get the California camper edition. So I have to get it out. I have to get it here. They only sell it in California. You are on the United States in 57. Wow, Big Island. Yeah, 67, 10 years later. Took the United States to uh, Europe. We went to Le Havre in France. And then coming home, took the Queen Mary, probably from Calais or Dover, uh, home. And, we had, and the reason we did that, we were going to fly home, but the reason we did that is because we could put the car on the boat. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, you know what happens to computers. Hard drives fail. Coffee spills. And then there's ransomware and other cyber threats. Keep your world safe from all those threats with the only cyber protection solution that delivers a unique integration of data protection and cybersecurity in one product, a Cronus Cyber Protect Home Office. You may remember it as a Cronus True Image. Everything you need to safeguard your device Windows, Mac, Android, iOS. I've been talking about a Cronus True Image for years. That's the best imaging package out there. And now it's bundled with cyber protection to make a Cronus Cyber Protect Home Office. Of course, one of the reasons I like imaging, it's a great way to back up and a very fast way to restore your computer to exactly a state that it was in. We used to use it on TV all the time because if the computer crashes, we'd only have a couple of minutes in a commercial break to get it back up and running. A Cronus True Image, boom. Boom, just blasts it onto the hard drive, and you're back up and running. Never lose precious files or expensive applications. Of course, you can always restore a full system, but this is nice. You can also pick and choose individual files from your image and restore those. And a Cronus True Image now has a Cronus Cloud. So you can back up what you want, where you want, locally, but also to the Cronus Cloud where it's safe. Restore your entire system to the same drive, the same computer, or a brand new computer. Great way when you've got a new system to just get it up and running immediately. Take that image. You've already made the image, right? You're making it all the time. Take it. You can even get it from the Acronis Cloud. Blast it on the new computer. You're good to go. You can create direct cloud-to-cloud -cloud backups, too. This is really nice. You don't have to download all your email from your Microsoft 365 account, then upload it. You can actually go directly from Microsoft 365 to the Acronis Cloud, your Outlook.com mailbox, your OneDrive, zoop, right across. It's fast, takes no effort on your part, no download time or upload time. This is a really nice way to back up your Microsoft 365 account. And, of course... Let's not forget the cybersecurity part of it. You can stop any cyber attack from damaging your data, your applications, your system, block attacks in real time before malware or ransomware or crypto jackers could cause damage. Find any hidden infections lurking on your system with very flexible virus scans. So it's all in one. One pane of glass gives you everything you need. Reduce the cost, the complexity, the risk, the weight of using multiple solutions that don't know about each other. Simplify your protection by managing everything through a single intuitive interface. You'll spend less time on the computer with a Cronus two-click setup and the set-and-forget options. It does it all automatically. And you can rest assured your digital world is protected with a Cronus integrated protection. That's a Cronus Cyber Protect Home Office. It's more than just a backup, more than just an antivirus. It's both. It's two. It's two in one. Peace of mind knowing your devices and your backups are protected. Your data is safe, accessible, private, authentic and secure. I like those five words. Keep your digital world safe from all the threats with the only cyber protection solution that delivers a unique integration of data protection and cybersecurity in one. A Cronus Cyber Protect Home Office. You may remember it as a Cronus True Image. 
Visit go.acronis.com slash techguy and check it out. Go.acronis.com slash techguy. Acronis Cyber Protect Home Office. So thank him so much for supporting the Tech Guy Show. Uh, thank you for supporting us by using that address. Now, back to the show. Oh, it's time once again for our photo guy, my personal photo sensei. Chris Marquardt is here. He is at sensei.photo. That's where he does coaching, instruction, workshops, all about getting better pictures, not only with digital, but film as well. He's working on his uh, second edition of his film photo book. The third, the third edition. Third edition. The third edition. Who would have yes. thought it? Who would have thought it? Oh, oh, I, I, we, we certainly did not expect this, this um, film photography topic to it's generate awesome. that much new stuff over the last like seven years. I mean, it's uh, been it's amazing. amazing. Yeah. Well, and you were the yeah. one who, you know, kind of talked me into it. I mean, I think it's a really, it's a great discipline. <laughs> and a lot of schools to this day, when you take a photography class, they start yep. you with film. Yep. You know? Yeah, because 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 there are no shortcuts, and that means you have to learn the ropes in terms of composition and and exposure and all the pre-visualization, all these kind of things. So but don't worry, folks, we're not going to get you get you taking film today. Today, nah. <laughs> it's just a little inspiration for uh, your photography, whether it's a, a camera phone or a fancy digital camera. What what are we talking about? Today? True. What's our lesson? Well, I I spent a week. I did a, a week of vacation at. Uh, the sea on an island up in the North Sea and I just returned from that and uh, of course I brought my camera and did some photography there so I thought we'd talk about taking photos at the sea if you're on vacation or if you live near the sea there's so many interesting cool things to see and uh, a lot of different uh, angles to I look agree. at things from I, agree. I love so, the sea Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So um, a few things. Just let's look at uh, some photos here. Um, first thing, if you shoot at the sea, where do you put the horizon? The line between the sky and the sea? Because <laughs> it's not it's not that obvious. And a lot of people will go to the rule of thirds and try to put it on one of these third lines, which yeah, usually works. But my, my recommendation here is put the... Put the horizon so that it's not in the way of something that is interesting looking in the picture. So let's say you have interesting clouds in the sky. Give them space. If you, if the water in front of is, in, is interesting, if there's something interesting in the water, give that space. Just put it wherever it feels right. Trust your trust your gut. That is um, certainly the right thing to do. Then... Um, Make sure, and that's, that's kind of a, a bit of a, one of my pet peeves. Make sure to have the horizon really straight. If you if you don't get it right within the camera, then straighten it afterwards. You can always fix water, it in post, yeah. And and especially with the water, with water, if that's out of whack for just a half a degree, <laughs> it'll look like it's running notice. downhill. It'll, yeah, <laughs> it'll be a bit of a problem. So that is something. Um, then what to include in a photo? Um, I try often try to include some form of landscape e either some rocks in the foreground or some uh, well depending on where you are you might have some some other features there or even include features that are man made in, in the front like a, a railing on a boardwalk or i don't know um ships in a in a in a marina for example um which brings us to another thing, and that is reflections. As soon as we have water involved, hey, we have reflections of some sort. Depending on how much wind there is, they might be stronger or, or, or um, well, less wind means stronger reflections. Let's put it that way around. So if if it's a an early morning, usually you have less waves and a bit more of the reflections, which can be really nice, which can add a real calming. A symmetrical element to pictures. So I like looking at reflections or using them. Um, and then, of course, very important, uh, if you're at the sea, the sunset. And sunsets can be anywhere from really boring, as in there's, <laughs> there's the horizon, there's the sun, there's nothing else going on. Or you might have really interesting clouds in the sky, something that the sun shines through 
Um, maybe some interesting waves at the bottom. That is always, always interesting. The thing that I, I also like to do is, um, you know, so, so you have this warm light coming from the sun and then the camera sometimes tries to kind of counter act that and get it more in the neutral area and take some of the warmth out so i like to bring some of the warmth back in by in 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 the app back on the computer um or in in in, in the photos app in my smartphone I, I i increase the warmth a bit the white balance the warmth whatever that is called in in your app of choice um always helpful make it golden and if you can come make it golden if make it Golden, yeah. yes, yeah. that's that's right. Um, another thing I'm a great fan of, and you get this sometimes at the sea, is volumetric light. We've talked about this in the past. It's light that gets, well, that, that has volume, that has a shape, and that happens when there is mist in the air, uh, which does happen at the sea, and there is the sun um, being f filtering through clouds. You get these streaks of light that, are like god rays you know they come from the sky and they look so majestic and light having volume is always cool for photography and then i also like including foreground elements like in any landscape kind of shot i like something in the foreground you know everything's um, better with a little dog in it i think and this in this case in this photo a little dog <laughs> little in the pooch. foreground now yeah. this this adds several things, okay? We have a silhouette of a dog, which is not too much information, but uh, it's nice. And we have a reflection because in the front, you have a bit of a tide pool kind of situation. So it's, it's, it's a little uh, thing separated from the wavy uh, sea. So that is more calm and gets better reflections. And that just combines a few of the things that we talked about. So... I'm a fan of that. And I'm a fan of this, which if you look at that, it looks like rocks sticking out of fog. So pretty. That is that is no fog. Oh. That is the sea because what the photographer did here is take a long exposure. We're talking 30 seconds, a minute. So the photographer put a, put an ND oh. filter on the camera like a like a very dark pair of sunglasses on the on the lens and what that does is it allows you to expose longer and get the motion in the water to to play out over time and it smears the motion and it gives it the surreal kind of feeling and you end up with this very wispy kind of water surface that is it's hard to describe but it if you see it the photo looks a bit strange a bit artificial a bit surreal but it it adds a very i think a very calming kind of touch mm -hmm. to it mm -hmm. some so. really good ideas we'll put a link to the gallery that uh, chris has put together into the show notes at techguylabs.com uh, so you can look at the images but uh, some very inspiring uh, ideas for things you might want to might want to uh, do with your camera now speaking of inspiration we have a photo assignment, and I want you to get to work because there's only a few weeks. Assignment. Only a few weeks left. <laughs> He's holding up the slip that says "elegant." That is the word. Yep. So, what your uh, assignment is, and by the way, it's not a competition. There are no prizes. The idea is just to get out there and take pictures. It's to go out and take an image with your camera phone, whatever you got, Instamatic doesn't matter, Brownie doesn't matter, of something that illustrates for you in your mind the idea, the word, the concept, elegant. And then, if you get something you like, <clears throat> upload it to Flickr.com. We have a tech guy group there. Tag it TG Elegant so Renee Silverman, our moderator, knows that's that's your uh, submission for the uh, competition. No, it's not a competition for the assignment. And then, <laughs> and then, what we're about two weeks. Uh, we only have about two weeks left, I would guess, yep. Chris. Yeah, yeah. So in a couple yeah. of weeks, Chris will pick three and talk about them on the radio. Chris Marquardt is at sensei.photo and, of course, joins us every week. Happy pictures, Chris. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Yeah. Ah, 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 ah. <clears throat> Thank you so much, sir. 
And of course, most of the pictures I took this week were, were of sheep, and <laughs> rabbit, and geese, and there's so many animals on that on that island. It was really relaxing. Which was what was really the name relaxing. of the island you were? Pelborm. P e l l w o r m. Oh, I'm not familiar Pelbom. with it. Pelborm. Small it... island. takes takes ten minutes with a car to drive from one side to the other. How nice! And you just stayed in a little bed and breakfast there, and. We we Relaxed. rented a, a little vacation flat kind of thing right behind uh, right right next to the sea, just a two nice. minute walk to the sea, and it was. Oh, Did you take so a bunch nice. of uh, pictures of the Alta Kirka? Um, we actually stayed right next to the Alta Kirka, oh, the kidding? old church. Oh wow! It had a it had a it has a steeple that broke off somewhere in the I don't know 18th century or something because it <laughs> was built on sand and it was. Well, that's interesting. It sounds like a very nice, relaxing vacation. That's what that that was exactly the point. Yeah, relaxation it sounds wonderful. There's not not that much you can do on that island. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> How fun! Lots of walks. What, was it chilly? Walks. It must have been kind of cool still. Well, we had very sunny days, oh, and good. it's still kind of cool because the North Sea is right. is famous for right. for having yeah. lots of wind and. Yeah. A bit of a chill, but hey, I'm, I like that. I go to the Himalaya, so that's I true. Don't mind the cold. It's warm to you. I like the cold. <laughs> yeah. How fun! Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you had a good vacation. We missed you, but I'm glad you're back. I'm glad to be back. Yeah. Are you going to post your pictures on uh, Flickr? Um. Yeah. Probably. Likely. I'm still. I'm. I'm still in vacation mode. We just returned yesterday, so nice. I'm still kind of settling back you in. You do look tan, slow, rested, and relaxed. You do. All right, Chris. Have a wonderful uh, right. week. I'll see you next week. See you then. Take care. Bye. Leo Laporte, the tech guy, 8888. <laughs> Ask Leo. Uh, deep track. No, that's good. Deep track. Jay on the line from Houston, Texas, our next caller. Hi, Jay. Hey, Leo. Good to talk to you. Appreciate it. Well, I appreciate your calling. Thank you. So here's what happened. I decided about six months ago, time to upgrade the phone. So I, uh, like an old timer, I looked in Consumer Reports, and they liked the uh, OnePlus, and we've always used uh, Motorola, Moto G. By the way, I'm an old timer too. Don't knock Consumer Reports. <laughs> no, no, Still I, the best. I had a milestone birthday yesterday. I'm older than you. Oh, so congratulations. Well. That's wonderful. Yes. I knew yeah. Dwight Silverman when he had hair and when my hair was brown. <laughs> that, that, that's, how, that's how old I am. Dwight, the great Houston uh, Chronicle columnist, still a good friend. Uh, glad yes, to glad to know uh, you, you 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 knew him when. Oh yes, and I learned a lot from him uh, over the years. So so Leo, what I did was I thought, okay, the Moto G4 needed to go. Yeah. Time to upgrade. Time. Okay. Consumer Reports liked uh, the. Okay, let me. I told Ken, let me get the numbers right. The OnePlus Nord N10 5G. Yes. So I thought, okay, I'll upgrade to 5G. And I got to tell you, I love the phone. It was refurbished, but it came with a three-month uh, warranty. So the phone worked fine, except something that's really annoying twice. Uh-oh. It will go, it'll go in and do some kind of an upgrade on its own. I don't right. know if it's upgrading the Android version or what. Yeah. And it's done it twice in six months. It did it a couple weeks ago. I woke up. Wanted to check my Gmail, and it said, you can't access Gmail because there's some kind of an up upgrade. So I turned the phone off, and truth be told, I went back to sleep for a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I woke up, and I got the old, like you're setting the phone up for the first time. Oh. I got the... I, it got the uh, pick your language. I'm like, oh, here uh -oh. we go again. Uh-oh. Did it erase everything? What? Well, here's what it did. I have uh, an app that will save my text messages and phone calls. And my contacts are saved through uh, Google, through a Gmail account. So that was fine. But it is annoying because you have to go in and reset the, uh, you know, visual settings. and then it So it, it went back to scratch. It went back to scratch. There was nothing, your pictures, everything that were on there. Well, photos, you know, I'm not big on photos. Uh, preface this, we're on the computer a lot for work. I'm we just trying to get a left. sense of what happened. Did it wipe well, the phone as if you just got it fresh from the factory, uh, or was there some of yeah. your stuff still on well, there? I use an app, SMS uh, Restore, and it brought the text messages, and I still had contacts and all that. I had to... Yes, yeah, so a lot of that will come sinking down from Google 
<clears throat> even with a brand yeah. new phone, as soon as you're, did you have to log into your Google account? I guess that's the question. Yes, I kind you of did. Back okay. In, uh, so once you logged in, contacts come in, calendar comes in, a lot of the settings will come in. If you back up the phone to Google, most people do. It's automatic. Then well, a lot. Okay, now true. I got to be honest. I'm not sure technically. I backed up to Google. I keep getting these things when I bought the phone. Do you know you want to do it through a OnePlus or do it through Google? But I do have all the contacts back. The biggest uh, problem is getting the apps that I've downloaded since. I, and by the way, there's not that many. But you got to go in with the username and password and, and do that. And it just took. In fact, my wife was telling people, oh, you know, what's what's Jay doing? Oh, he's busy. Uh, yeah, this you know. should not happen. <laughs> Whatever happened is not normal and it shouldn't have happened. Okay. So, okay. by the way, one little trick for uh, when you do have to restore your, you probably figured this out, restore your old apps, you can go to the Google Play Store and uh, go into your account and it'll show you apps you've purchased. And there's even a tab on this phone, not on this phone. So you can okay. quickly go to a tab that'll say the apps that are, not currently installed, but that you have installed in the past. That that's what I always do. I mean, uh, but you're right; you'll still have to log in. How cheap I am! I don't think any of these apps are ones I paid. Yeah, they don't call, they don't care. It's free and purchased, so it's not okay. so much that you spent money for it; you just downloaded it. I don't know why they call okay. it purchased. Well, I had to, <clears> you know, I, I I downloaded them, and then that's uh, the problem. Is even if there's only a handful of them, the log in and all that stuff is annoying. Oh, Most it's, it's, stuff it's, it's, these it's, days. It's, Keeps its uh, keeps the data online, so you probably didn't lose anything. But that is not supposed to happen. What happened to you is not supposed to happen. Okay. Because what I wondered was: is there somewhere in the settings, or do I go to Google Play and I can not get any kind of an automatic update? That another no, no updates should never do that. An update. First of all, you okay. do want automatic updates. Uh, the ones that installs automatically are critical updates, and you certainly want those. They're not just okay. Android updates. There is a monthly critical update patch from Google. I don't remember if OnePlus. Uh, automatically pushes those out in a timely fashion. Some carriers do, mm -hmm. some carriers don't. But that's not what happened. You had a crash. Uh, you had a okay. serious crash. And I'm. Okay. it's a little confusing. <clears throat> I've never seen that behavior. Now, unfortunately, with Android, every phone is different. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if this is something <clears throat> that typically happens at a, with a Nord. Or you bought this new, yes? Well, uh, Leo, I did buy it refurbished. Okay. I will say we bought our phones. We were a little bit late into the uh, smartphone uh, area. We are on a computer a lot. We have one of the last high school reunion planning companies in the in the country. Oh, neat! <laughs> there is such a thing. We've done it for twenty seven years, so we're oh, on. That's cool. Next year is my fiftieth. Uh, Oh, um, my 50th was last year, so oh, I'm ahead of you a little bit. Oh, gosh. I don't know if I want to go. I remember in college bartending the 50th reunion at my college and thinking how old those guys looked. <laughs> <laughs> now yeah. I are one of them. <clears throat> well, I actually wrote a story for the Houston Chronicle two years ago. This was 2020 because we didn't do any in 2020 because of the pandemic. And uh, someone found out that... We're still in business, but we're having to sit it out. So yeah. I wrote a story yeah. that said uh, high school reunions and social distancing are not a good match. No. And uh, are the reunions usually in the summertime? Yeah, you know, we just got through doing four in April. Oh, and, so they're uh, coming back. Surprisingly, they drew really well. We good. normally didn't do that. I good. The problem is Houston is so hot in the summer. Oh, right. In the late spring. That's right. I think people like the idea of coming back when it wasn't 95 degrees right. and 90 percent. No, I think you're right. <laughs> so, I think you nailed that one. So, okay, so you think the phone actually crashed. It, now, I it, uh, it, I it well, we, I hope you won't, I hope you'll forgive this crudity. It barfed <clears throat> and, uh, and it, and it really is not a normal thing. Uh, right. it, it, Maybe if you got it refurbished, it was a good thing because maybe it's kind of now cleared itself out. But if that happens again, there's a hardware flaw with that phone. Okay. I wondered about that. That's a hardware error. Uh, that It looks like the firmware decided to reinstall itself and, wow. uh, and it acts as if it's a brand new phone. That's not supposed – that should never happen. I've never seen that happen on any Android phone. Okay, because, uh, Leo, we've had different versions of Moto G starting with the very first one. They're great. Every time there's an up, 
Yeah, yeah. great phones, you yeah. know, especially for our use. And Here's the, I'll tell you, uh, it's too late now, but <clears throat> for future, I almost always say just get the Google phone. And what they oh, do yeah. is they release the major one, which, uh, you know, was the Pixel 6 in the fall. And then right around now, they'll announce a Pixel 6a, which will be about half the price. It's still a little more expensive than that Nord, maybe 500 bucks, but it's not as expensive as the full-blown phone. And those are the ones I recommend for several reasons, mostly because they get the Google updates in, a, in the most prompt fashion because it's from Google. Okay. So for future, I would say, you know, look for the Pixel something A, okay. the, the A versions of the Pixels. Do you think this problem happened necessarily because it's refurbished? No, it even happened with no. I don't know why it happened. Uh, it mm -hmm. you know it may be the reason you got it refurbished is because the original owner had that happen and said I'm getting rid of it. Oh, okay. Refurbishment won't correct something like that. If right. knock on wood, and I am, uh, it won't happen again. If it starts to happen more than once, that's too much of a pain. Get rid of it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It should it shouldn't happen ever at all. It's okay. A, it's a weird uh, thing. Okay. So um, Leo, that's yeah. what I thought. You know, I was pat, uh, I was patting myself on the back because I got it for around two hundred dollars. Yeah, sure. And I know that they sell new, and I'd always had good luck with refurbished. Uh, who who did the refurbishing? Is always the question. I bought it through Best Buy, and in fact, oh, that might be all right. Some I was going through some stuff, uh, tossing out some stuff, and I found a box that it came in, and I looked at it, and there was kind of a, a mark that said uh, kind of that the refurbished uh, <laughs> refurbishedness was done, and it got it was uh, an approved for sale. So, so, may, so uh, here's an example. Uh, I think it's probably true in Texas. In California, if the box was opened... If it was used as a demo or if somebody bought it, opened it, and immediately returned it, it cannot be sold as new. So they will okay. sell it as refurbished. Often that's a huge discount just because it was open. So it may be as good as new. Does okay. it, did, were there any uh, on the body? Was it Were there any fine uh, scratches or anything? Did it look? No, Leo. It was really, it just, it looked uh, pristine. So that's probably what it was. It was, it, and, uh, it, yeah, it was fine. Now I saved that tag that was on the side of the box. I'm going to look at it again, and uh, you know when it's refurbished, uh, you can uh, you can. Uh, I think it comes with a Best Buy uh, right. guarantees it for three months. Right. And I actually bought it with an Amex card, and Perfect. you can extend it for three more Smart months. Smart man. Now those six the six months are up. Oh. So, oh well. Yeah. Um, okay. Well. Yeah. Like I said it's we're not on the phone a lot because we're on the computer a lot. You know, searching for people. Are we off the air now? Yeah. Well, we're on a podcast, okay. so you're not completely anonymous. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Leo's going to say if you're class, if you're in touch with whoever's doing your reunion, uh, we are really good at locating. What's the name of the company? Uh, it's Reunions by Class Act. Okay. <laughs> and our website is reunionscoop.com. The scoop came from, uh, I used to be a newspaper reporter. That's how I met Dwight back oh, neat. at Beaumont Enterprise. And uh, it's not much to look at, but I've written every word on it, so hopefully it makes sense. And and your expertise is finding the alums? Well, yes, we locate people, we find a place. I think the two main reasons we're still in business, Leo, we keep the price down. There's no reason to make it over $50. And with Facebook, the way Facebook has grown, it's easy for people to yeah. keep in touch yeah. online, and they right. don't feel the need to meet in person. So we're right. good at finding people, we keep the price down. This looks great. And, uh, I will, Yeah, if I get an email, I will refer it uh, to them. Cause... I was going to tell your organizers we're good at finding people, so if they're still... Uh, uh, you know, you're obviously easy to find. Let's see if they find me. <laughs> That'll be the challenge. <laughs> do, they, do they send out anything or do they just assume that you'll Well, let's see. Uh, I was class of 73. Okay. So it's a year out. It'll be next year, right? Yeah. So I would think that somebody's thinking about it. I'm not on Facebook. That's probably the best place to go. To figure that yeah, out, and, uh -huh. and you know, Leo, we've learned a lot. Facebook uh, gives people license to, uh, you know, everybody's oh, yeah. a critic, so it like oh, they yeah. think they know what they're doing, oh, and they'll yeah. they'll do it someplace, and they'll just assume, oh, it'll be like our twenty year reunion, two hundred people will show up, mm -mm. and then they realize that most of the Facebook group isn't going to show up, but there's right. other people in the class who will show up. Right. So it's 
it's an interesting way to make a living. We sort of coexisted with Facebook. You know, we know it's hurt attendance, but it helps us get the word out. So obviously, if someone in a class is a member of a Facebook group, we don't have to search for them because by right. being a member, they're already located. Right. So that helps a little bit, too. Well, uh, look for the class of 73 Santa Cruz High. <laughs> oh, you know, I thought you uh, I thought you uh, were from uh, Rhode Island or New Hampshire. I was. We moved when I was uh, in ninth grade. We moved from Providence to uh, Santa Cruz. So I graduated oh, okay. from Santa Cruz High. Uh, Santa Cruz High, 73. Yeah. Wow. Class of 73. I had no, I, I had no idea. And you, uh, Leo, your mom is still living, right? She's alive. She's going to be 90 in January. She lives in Cranston. She moved back. I don't know why. She had this beautiful f farm in uh, yeah. in uh, Santa Cruz. And she said, no, all my, f all my friends and family are back there. I'm going back. So my yeah. sister lives back there. She lives back there. And I'm going to go visit her yeah. any day now because... Helps keep an eye on her. Yeah, we'll, uh, yeah. listen, it was great to get through. You actually, uh, this has been bugging me for some time. And I, I, in fact, while I was on hold, I'm looking up here, how to turn off Android updates on OnePlus Nord 10. It talks about going into Google Play Store. But you're saying in this case, Leo, this shouldn't, obviously shouldn't Should happen. not have happened. Updates should not do anything like that. What will okay. normally happen in an update is it'll ask you, it'll say, I've downloaded the up update, would you like me to right. apply it? It will never do it automatically. You say, okay. you should say yes at that time, but do, do it when you go to bed because it will take a while. It'll apply the update, and then, weirdly, it has to go through every app and update okay. that. It recompiles the header, so it redoes the app. So that's okay. the thing that takes the longest time. But at that point, it should come back, and your phone should be exactly the same. You might get a little announcement saying, hey, now you have the new version mostly you won't right. those updates are okay. supposed to come out every month those are security updates and they're very important mm -hmm. especially on android yes. yeah leo do you think it would help i keep getting these uh since this happened the last time i get these notes from OnePlus saying do you want to finish setting up your phone oh that's and interesting I, I, I consider it a little bit intrusive. Should I actually say yes this time? And well, just see what they want. They probably want you to create a OnePlus account. Don't. This is a Chinese okay. company. I'm not, you know, I, uh, okay. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give them any more information than you need to. Okay, so don't create. They are very nice phones, phone. though. I, I think you know, it's a good choice. I really, it does everything yeah. we want, but we're holding off because my wife wanted the same phone. I said, not just yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they sell new now for about 500 about the same as a Pixel 6a will cost. So, uh, yes. so get her a 6a when those are announced in the next month or okay. two. Okay, that sounds good. Listen, Leo, it was great to talk. I've been listening. I was going to say long-time listener, first-time complainer, but I, I didn't want you to think. I, I didn't want you to But think. not about me. I would have taken it personally. You know me. Okay. <laughs> hey, it's uh, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you see uh, Dwight, say hi. I might see him before you do, but if you Well, he, uh, he wrote about an old-time electronics place that hopefully will fix the CD player on my, <laughs> my wife's ancient Corolla, so uh, I'm a dumb I'm going to go there next week and tell them he uh, he Dwight sent me. Yeah, I love Dwight. Yeah, yeah. it's a great guy. Uh, Leo, did you know a guy named Frank Emmett years ago who worked for Compaq? I told him many years ago, uh, He Compaq had a store, you know, they were located here. Yeah. And they had a store on the North Freeway called Compaq Works. And I mentioned, I said, well, I, I graduated from, uh, from you know who, KK. To uh, Leo and and uh, Frank goes. Oh, many years ago, I knew Leo. Oh, he's been involved with computers for many the name years. is dimly familiar, and I may well have met him in the. Com I mean, Compact's long gone. I might have met him in those days, though. Absolutely, yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah. Okay, Leo, I won't keep you, but thanks a bunch. We really appreciate. My it. pleasure, Jay. Thanks for calling. Thank you. You're welcome. Well, hey, 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 how are you today, Leo Laporte? Here, the tech guy. Time to talk about computers, the internet. Home theater, digital photography, smartphones, smart watches, all that jazz. 8888-ASK-LEO. 888-827-5536 is the phone number. If you want to talk computers, the internet, home theater, digital photography, I'm here for you, baby. Website, techguylabs.com. I'll put a link for our last caller uh, who said he had a OnePlus Nord, which did an automatic reset after updating. And I'll put a link uh, because Scooter X in our chat room has found an, uh, something on the OnePlus forums from a couple of years ago saying the phone 
did a factory reset after an update. Apparently, it's something uh, uh, maybe that uh, OnePlus has had a problem with in the past. So that could have been what happened. Now, this is two years ago, but maybe this is an issue OnePlus uh, has and uh, knows about. Should not happen. Your phone should never reset itself back to factory uh, settings. That's not. Only if you ask it to. Michael, uh, Tahunga, California. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Hi, Michael. Uh oh. Something on the OnePlus forums. Turn off that radio because I am on with you. Saying the phone did a thing. It's not going to happen. But you know, that's funny. That's really old school. Haven't had to do that in a long time. <laughs> Mike, I'm going to put you on hold. As soon as you hear me say, turn off the radio, turn off the radio, and I'll come back to you. Meanwhile, Micah is on the line from Maine. Hi, Micah. Hey, Leo. Great to talk to you. And you just revealed something about yourself that I had no idea about, and that is that you have been the tech guy since you were 12 years old. <laughs> well, not really. Uh, when I was 12, we barely had rocks. Yes, but the SS United States was oh, yeah. the most highest tech ocean liner ever made to this day. It's a be it was a beautiful ship. That's what I wanted to hear a little bit about. You yeah. know, there was no wood allowed on that ship except for the mahogany piano and butcher block uh, in the in the kitchen. Oh, I didn't know that. Only wood allowed. Yeah, because they were so concerned with fire safety, and it was also filled with asbestos at the time. Oh, nice. Uh, and, yeah, it was, yeah. and it was designed. It was paid for fifty million dollars of it. It was a seventy-eight million dollars ship. Fifty million dollars was paid for by the government to, so it could be easily converted to a troop ship, and the other twenty-eight million dollars by the company that owned it. Oh, I'll and be she's darned. still afloat in Philadelphia. I don't know if you knew that. I did know, and it's sad because uh, she's rusting away. She was decommissioned uh, not too long after I sailed on her, and has just been sitting there. And sixty-nine. Yeah, yeah, they're hoping that, like the Queen Mary, the other boat I sailed on. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, that somebody will take her and turn her into a, you know, an a, a, a attraction. Because, um, yeah, the fastest uh, ship at the time ever to have crossed the Atlantic, a little under five days. Still holds the world's record. Yeah, still, still does. The world's record. No kidding. Yeah, 40, uh, it's, its highest speed set in that uh, for the ocean liner was 43 miles an hour. Holy cow. It, top speed, it could actually hit 49 miles an hour, which is incredible for some so big. Well, I was just a little uh, little kid, so I didn't I didn't appreciate any of that. I did like the fact that uh, you know they had uh, soup every night for dinner in the <laughs> in the dining room. <laughs> I have to say though, it's interesting to co contrast it, which was uh, with a very modern ship, with the ship we sailed home on, the Queen Mary, which was on its second to last voyage and was very much the opposite. A lot of wood, uh, you know, a, a classic ocean liner. And there were two very different experiences, both of which I fell in love with. Uh, and, you know, it's made me love boats ever since. Well, what people don't realize is they don't make ocean liners anymore. They make cruise ships. I know. Completely different things. Cunard, and, uh, Cunard has, you know, some, you know, the Queen Elizabeth II and some kind of ocean liners. But there really are cruise ships, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, very different. Yeah. But I'm wondering if, if you have any actual memories of it, because you've, you've been on the Queen Mary, obviously, probably as, a, as, a, as an adult as well, since she's docked not so far away from you, really. And, yeah, no, it's quite a thing to go there and kind of go, oh, I vaguely remember this. Again, I was 11 years old. I'm trying to, I do remember the first impression of the United States. Uh, she was docked. In New Jersey, I think we should uh, somewhere like Newark. It wasn't uh, down in New York City. We went, and I remember arriving, and of course we were all dressed up because in 1967 this was fancy, fancy. And uh, I remember coming up to the boat and see, being stunned at how huge it was. It towered over us, and of course I was little, so anything would tower over me. But I did very much remember that. I don't much remember anything of the actual voyage except uh, the food of course which was quite naturally which was quite good <laughs> no. i remember on the queen mary i remember sitting on the deck chairs it was quite cold it's an atlantic crossing covered with blankets and the steward would come with a little cup of bouillon i thought that was pretty cool for you to sip as you were freezing on the deck 
Yeah, very traditional on the British ships to oh, serve yes. beef bouillon. And, yes. uh, and and I remember at, at that age, I was uh, growing up in, in New Jersey. We'd drive into Brooklyn to visit my folks and we uh, my grandparents, and we'd drive down the West Side Highway, and that's where all the, the ocean liners were. And I remember driving by the United States and the France and the Queen, Huge. And the Queen Mary. Huge. And, and they were amazing to see. Yeah. And they're just uh, not around anymore. It Although, like sad. I said, you, yeah. you know, to, to see that rusting hulk of the United States when I go to Philadelphia, still very, very sad. I sh we've turned this into boat talk, and I apologize. Micah, by the way, is all about airplanes, and so he, he likes, obviously, you like travel. Um, I do remember uh, in 19, let's see, it would have been in the early 80s, sailing on one of the last sailings of the old Rotterdam, which was, a, was an ocean liner that Holland America yeah. had converted into a cruise ship, and we went on a Caribbean cruise on it, and it reminded me quite a bit of the old Queen Mary. I loved it. The old Rotterdam was a beautiful boat. Beautiful. And it's the same with the uh, the France was converted by, uh, yeah. I, guess, I guess, Holland America into the Norway. And That's I, right. She's gone now. Yeah. But she became a cruise ship as well. You no, know, so. the France was was what the great cruise ship, everyone says. My mom sailed on it when she was a young woman to France. So yeah. there you go. Ocean liner talk. I had no idea it was high tech. That's very interesting. No, the, the, the United States was the highest tech uh, uh, ocean liner ever built and, and one of the last ones ever built. And uh, uh, just, just amazing when you, you look up the facts about it. And that's, yeah. that's why I called because it really was, it's a tech thing. You know, put, you talk put out of business tech. by the uh, airlines, I guess, and transatlantic flights. Absolutely. It was yeah. the Boeing 707 that, that, that killed her. So. Yeah. Was it Pan Am? What, were the, what was the big transatlantic Carrier. Pan Am. Pan Am was the first one to buy the 707. Pan American and World Airways. Yeah. Uh, the old Pan Am, they were the first ones to buy the 707 and the first one to fly the 747. Are there any 707s still in service? <laughs> it's funny you should mention that because I'm writing a piece about that right now for the Airplane Geeks because in a few weeks we will be ce celebrating our 707th episode, 14 years. Oh, congratulations. Uh, You're almost as thank you almost much. as long uh, lived as uh, our podcasts are. That's great. Yeah, we, we, we're, we're getting there, but we only have to do it weekly, not twice a week like yeah. you. And we're only an hour and a half. So uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we have 1,800 episodes in the in the bank now. Uh, well, that's great. Congratulations. So what 707s are out there? Uh, none. None. I mean, the, 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 the Air Force still flies the KC-135, which is a 707, but there are no commercial 707s flying as far as I know. Oh, that's too bad. And maybe a little more up to date. What's going on with Boeing? Oh, I don't The thing you need to remember about Boeing and um, is that Boeing is the name Boeing, but it's the company McDonnell Douglas. Ah. McDonnell Douglas took Boeing's money, bought Bo in, in, it, in trade, bought Boeing, took the name, and has been run by McDonnell Douglas ever since. And it's ah. not the old Boeing, which is very, very sad. The, the Boeing that we knew that created the B-17, and the B-17 is really what the, the, the World War II bomber is what got them going and turned them into the company that changed the world. And then the you know, the B-52, which is going to be flying until long after we're dead. And the 707 is gone. The 747 is gone. And they've had trouble ever since. In fact, they just canceled the, uh, well, delayed the 777X project, which uh, was supposed to be flying by now. And they're talking about maybe bringing it back in 2024. So it's, I will, because you've been so nice, Micah, uh, I will put on the video for the show a picture of me, my mom, and my sister aboard the SS United States. You see the pier there that says United States Lines sailing out of New York Harbor in 1967. Micah, pleasure talking to you. 8888 Ask Leo. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. More of your calls coming up just around the corner. Website techguylabs.com. And uh, I guess I'll have to put that picture on Tech Guy Labs, won't I? All right. <laughs> More of your calls right after this. <laughs> You see how dressed up we were, Micah? Oh, you can't you can't see it probably. Oh, he's gone. Oh well. Oh well. Yeah, I was wearing a brown tweed suit, it looks like. <laughs> wow. I think my yeah, this is us getting ready to go, right? It's the same outfit, I think. And then uh Yeah. Oh, and my poor sister Eva, that's Eva. That was her doll. She lost that over uh, the side of the boat uh, on the trip. 
<laughs> a great tragedy. A great tragedy. Here my mom and dad are on the boat also. I probably took that, didn't learn, I hadn't learned about headroom yet. <laughs> uh, it's really fun to have those. That's really fun. Here we are in, uh, I think this is Waterloo. I remember going to see the battlefield of Waterloo. Yeah, there's another one. Sailing away. I tell you, it got in my brain. It got in my brain. That's why I do cruising. I mean, I I really would love to go on. Uh, you know, actually, the, probably should have joined the Merchant Marine or something, but should have gone to sea. Join the Navy to see the sea. Oh, here we go. Here's a picture of the boat of the SS United States. I think, or no, maybe this is the Queen Mary. Now I'll have to. If I could see more of that stack, I would know. I think we're dressed differently, aren't we? Yeah, this is going home. That's the Queen Mary. I still have that raincoat. <laughs> Here's my sister at Mont Saint-Michel. I remember that very well. Yeah, we got all the family slides converted. And... uh it's nice to have them all. In the summertime, baby, Leo Laporte, the tech guy. It is May Day. I mean, it's not technically summer, but the first day of May. That's a that's that's when it all begins, doesn't it? Rod Pyle, astronaut, spaceman. Well, he's not really an astronaut, but a spaceman. He's no more an astronaut than I. Coming up in just a little bit to talk about space. Meanwhile, back to the phones we go. Let's try uh, Michael again in Tahunga. Hi, Michael. Hey there, Leo. How are you doing? I am great. Welcome to the show. Boy, thanks for taking my call, I tell you. Well, thanks for hanging on. I know you were on for a while, so I appreciate it. There you go. Hey, I have a uh, Idea Center um, Lenovo desktop. Yes. And and uh, the, uh, the date on the build for that unit was uh, back in 2016. Well, all, all of the moving about of stuff, furniture and have, what have you, uh, we have seemed to misplace the disk for the program operating system 10. Oh, that's and, no uh, problem. Who needs that? In fact, I'm surprised it came with a disk. These days, yeah. they often don't. Well, even though it came with the disk, it got misplaced. Yeah, you don't need it. Saying, so uh, Microsoft offers it for free for download. What you okay. what you'll want is a thumb drive. I think you'll need a eight gigabyte thumb drive. Sixteen would be better. You have need enough space to put the Windows installer on it. That's what was on that disk. Now there may be some specific Lenovo stuff on there, uh, but you can get that after you install Windows by going to the Lenovo site and getting what they call the drivers. For Windows 10. Yeah. It's probably a good idea. You want to rebuild the machine? What are you doing? What do you need? Well, um, I also misplaced the operator's owner's manual for it. So there's a lot of... It came with a manual? Wow. Let's just, let's just say that there would be some homework ahead of me. I can walk um, you through it. <laughs> That's hysterical. The last computer I bought, a Macintosh Mac Studio, came with a manual that was a sheet of, not even a big sheet of paper. It was a little tiny pamphlet that just said, look online if you got any questions. You probably can get the manual as well from Lenovo.com. They, they offer it for download if you really want to read it. What do you want to do? Well, I'm trying to wake it up because when I power it up, it goes to a blue screen with a lot of uh, prompts on. Yeah, the Windows is Windows is dead. So we can fix that. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple of things I'm going to do for you. I'm going to put a link in the show notes to the Microsoft Media Creation Tool is what they call it, where you download a copy of the Windows 10 installer. And... It wants to be, you could install on a CD, but really it wants to be installed on a thumb drive. That's the best way to do it. So you'll download that 
and it has instructions for putting it on a thumb drive. The only trick on this is you have to tell the idea center, now don't boot from the internal hard drive. That's what keeps crashing. I want you to boot to the thumb drive. And there's a little setting in your setup that you turn turn that on. You say it's a boot order setting. You say boot first to the thumb drive. It'll boot up, and it, it's, a, it's not a full Windows. It's just a Windows installer. You can walk through it. What I would suggest if you're having all these problems, is there anything on that drive you want to get back? Uh, can actually, you... I don't. I don't believe when my daughter uh, was in, who was in college at the time. I don't believe at that. She probably time got everything. Needed... Yeah. Yeah, she took what she needed. Yeah. And, so, it, so it's not been used since then. What's that? It hasn't been used since then. Correct. Okay. Can you get to Windows at all, or does it blue screen before you even get Windows going? Blue screen before anything. Yeah. If you could get to Windows, you know, at least get to a login, there is a reset command that's built into the computer. But since you can't get to Windows, let's just wipe the whole hard drive and start over. And that's what this Windows media creation tool will do for you. Once you install, reinstall Windows 10, by the way, you don't need a serial number because it had Windows 10 on it before. Microsoft already has it in the database. They say, oh, yeah, that idea center is fine. You own it. So they'll, yeah. they'll authenticate it, no problem. The other link I'm going to put in the show notes uh, for you, so I'm going to put that so you know where to down and only get it from Microsoft. Don't get it from anybody else. It's Microsoft.com. Yeah. Download Windows 10 disk image, it says. And then... Uh, uh, the other thing I'll put a link in to uh, the show notes for you, if it's a value, is where you can find Lenovo's manuals. So those manuals you can download on another system or on a smartphone. They're just PDFs. And, and, and then you can read those. I don't think there's going to be much of value in there. <laughs> it's been a long time since a company actually put anything interesting in their manuals. Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that's where he things are uh, headed. Yeah, in yeah. I mean, I, honestly, I haven't seen a manual come with a computer in a long time. That mo all the manual ever has these days is a is they don't even have if text is a picture of where the on off switch is, and you know how to plug it in and how to turn it on, and then the rest is up to you. I'm sorry, you're on your own. Uh, so Lenovo will have those instructions online. You'll also want to go there to get, uh, after you install uh, the vanilla version of Windows, which is what you'll get from Microsoft, uh, you'll install the specialized drivers that are for that particular machine. You'll also get those from Lenovo. So the, original, the original Windows 10 was home version. That's fine. So get the home version, yeah. Home is fine. No one needs Pro. Pro is for businesses. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, okay. I've, I'm going to uh, dig into your... It's a little uh, project. Yeah, it's a little project re recuperating the old lost idea center. I love it. <laughs> what is the, what is the uh, uh, ID on the uh, show notes for Tech, this one? Tech Guy Labs, yeah. and this is episode 1890. It won't be there right away. It takes us a day or two to get all that stuff up, but tomorrow everything should be up there. 1890 is the number. 1890. Right. It was a good year. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Michael. Hey, you're very welcome, and I appreciate you being there for us. My pleasure. Yeah, on, on, on most modern machines, if you can at least get logged into Windows, there is, you go into the menu, and there's a reset your PC, just there is, as there is nowadays on most phones, a reset your PC to the factory op, uh, original settings. And in most cases, that will also give you a chance if you wish to preserve your data. So it just all it does is reinstalls Windows on top of the old Windows. And usually that's enough to get things working. The only thing that you might want to worry about, Michael, it's possible that in the period that it was sitting in the closet, the hard drive died. You know, it has serious flaws, in which case you may not be able to install Windows. It may have a dead hard drive. You could replace that if you wish. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. He's our rocket man, Rod Pyle. Editor-in-chief of the beautiful Ad Astra magazine. 
There they are. He also has written many books, <laughs> including Interplanetary Robots, True Stories of Space Exploration, Amazing Stories of the Space Age, Blueprint for a Battle Star, and the world famous. Actually, I love this book. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm just teasing you around. First on the Moon, the Apollo 11 50th anniversary experience. He is our space guy, host of This Week in Space with Tarek Malik from space.com. Is there anything I've left out from your CV? Uh, no, it just it looked like a KTEL commercial <laughs> where they used to throw all those records <laughs> on the ground, right? Like, and you get this, and too, and a set of Gintu knives. So, oh, my goodness. Rod, it's good to see you. Good to see you. Uh, I like to check in with Rod every week to make sure there's no asteroids hitting for heading for the uh, uh, the Earth. Are we safe? Well, we are. So, but but first, let me uh, just address this Rogozin comment about okay. the space station. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Everybody out, in so. the chat room wants to know. The Russians yeah. say that's it. We're out after sanctions. No more do with ISS. We're done. We're going home. Dosvedanya, tovarish. Where it's well said. Yes. So you know, this is just an increasing tempo of rhetoric from Rogozin. We know Rogozin's a blowhard. He's he is the head of the he, Russian Space Agency. He's the head of the Russian Space Agency. But not Agency. a scientist, not an that, astronaut, no. a political appointee. He's a and this is he's a guy Mr. Putin's says, guy. He he is. He's he's in Mr. Putin's palm. And and he's the guy that said, you know, in twenty fourteen when we were pushing back in Ukraine, maybe you want to take a trampoline to the space station, and then more <sighs> recently, maybe you can fly your brooms up there. We have Elon. We don't need you. Goodbye. Kind of, yeah. And and after he made that broomstick comment, as you may have seen, Elon put up a tweet that said the American broomstick with a picture of one of his rockets, which I thought was great. Uh, you know, so the Russians were partners in the beginning. This is of the space station. This is something that we set up at the fall of the Soviet Union to a large extent to keep their scientists and engineers off the streets and from working with Iran and other hostile powers. So it was kind of a charity project. Oh, I didn't sense. know that. It was kind of like, yeah. oh, you guys, you stay with us. We'll help you. We'll keep you busy. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. But, but they had good hardware and we could use it. They had been preparing to build another space station. So we took some of those modules and there were, uh, one of them particularly is at the core of ours. So, you know, you could talk about unplugging from the space station you could talk about no longer cooperating if you're russia those are two different things there's some problems though there's miles of cabling there's a lot of stuff that you'd have to do to disconnect these modules the russian module in particular is old and creaky and full of cracks and there's really nothing they'd want to do with it except make a political point so they might abandon it in place Critically, the Russians have been providing propulsion to keep the space station up in its proper orbit. But since, I think, at least 2018, NASA has been experimenting with uh, Northrop Grumman's Cygnus delivery vessel, which is a capsule that takes uh, cargo up there, to use it to reboost the orbit. And, of course, Elon Musk has, has his Dragon 2 capsules, which could do the same thing. Would take a little bit longer boosting, but they could do it. So this isn't a crisis. It's an inconvenience. On the other side of the equation, the Russians need our money. Their space program is desperately underfunded. It's in crisis right now. Because Are we Western giving them sanctions. money? I mean, or is that not included yeah. in the sanctions? Oh, okay. It's part of the space station agreement. So we, we are so, continuing to do that. Money and in kind, yeah. So there's and there's a lot of prestige, national prestige at stake here. So pulling out would be a significant ding to them. So personally, I think it's a lot of hot air. Most uh, journalists I, I know think so, but it could happen. Could happen. And if so, then it might take SpaceX, I don't know, three or four months to get something ready to do the same job, right? I'm I'm being glib, but uh, I, I think... Put Elon SpaceX on trampoline. Send him to Space Station. Yeah. Well, and, and SpaceX works fast and their hardware is good. So let's not You're worry about that. You're saying we don't need the Russians. And probably yeah. they need us more than we need them and they're not. Yeah, I'd say the right. latter. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. we'd like to keep them in the game, but if it's if they insist on leaving to make right. a point, that's right. on them. Right. Let's talk about asteroids though. Yes, I want to know. Are we are we safe? Are so, we okay? So asteroid two thousand eight AG thirty three flew past Earth's orbit on April twenty eighth, which is last Thursday. Oh whew. was it a near miss? It well, it was 2 million miles. Oh. So that's a lot. That's eight times the distance of the moon. But in, you know, cosmic terms, that's pretty close. It's enough to get our attention. Yeah. You know, these things come near to Earth orbit and then go around the sun and then pass back out to the outer solar system. This particular one is on a seven-year circuit. Now, it's between 1,100 and 2,600 feet across. So it's a big rock. 
uh, size of two supercarriers or two Empire State Buildings, wow. roughly. Wow. So it's a great big rock, probably. Uh, Enough is it a planet that, killer if it hit us? Would it No, it's a region killer. So it would take out it could take out San Francisco or, or Manhattan, which is a big concern. Uh, a little uncertain exactly how big the crater would be if it hit. If it hit on land, it could be anywhere between five miles and twelve. Craters have hit. I mean, there are evidence of craters oh, yeah. in Russia. There was one not so long ago. Uh we had an asteroid, probably is what killed the dinosaurs. So much it's, bigger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's probably worth it paying attention. It is. And let's remember Chelyabinsk, which was about 20 times the size of the Hiroshima blast when in terms of energy <sighs> release was only 60 feet across. So this is wow. many, many multiples of that. Wow. So estimates are the explosion, if it exploded, uh, would be upwards uh, the energy. Let's just say the energy upwards of 7000 megatons. And Russia's Tsar Bomba from back in the 60s was about 55 megatons. So it's a big deal. So the important message here is it was a comfortable miss. It's not going to be a risk in the near future unless its orbit alters. But we need to see the rest of them. We still haven't charted all the big rocks out there. We definitely haven't charted the smaller ones. And NASA and others, the Chinese are now taking up this cause as well, need funding to get more telescopes in orbit get more telescope time on Earth's surface, and start experimenting with, messages, uh, with uh, methods of, of intercepting these things and diverting them. You're not going to blow them up. They're too big. But if you can divert their path far enough out, even by just a couple of degrees, they miss the Earth. You, know, you remember geometry, right? That angle keeps expanding. Yeah. And they'd miss the Earth, but that takes budgeting. So as we've discussed before, we do have the DART mission, which is the double asteroid redirect test which is going to slam in September or October, is going to slam a little 1,200-pound NASA spacecraft into a small rock called Dimorphos. It's a little moon of a larger asteroid, just to see if it works. And assuming that that is effective, then we're going to start larger tests. Now the Chinese are talking about the same thing. And for my money, this might be one place where we can finally talk about international cooperation with the Chinese yeah, because we're, we're both doing the same thing, and it's a really good cause. We're saving all in our this bacon, planet right? together, yes. Yeah, and if the U.S. gets taken out by a giant asteroid, China's principal market collapses, and they're in really bad shape. So well, there might be repercussions, reverberations. You think? Yeah. And there's <laughs> 27,000 of these things at yeah. least. Okay. So wow. that's, that's an estimate. So we want to know where they are. And, uh, you know, we want to do more science to see if we can stop them from being a problem. Yeah. So Solar in, system in this, is a mess. In this case, do look up. Yes. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Definitely look, look up. up. Take it real. And, and that, you know, the, the message is that movie. Some people liked it. Some didn't. A lot of people made fun of it. But, you know, do you think it was far off from reality? I don't. No. Well, we'll know when something is headed our way, I guess. But it well, climate change is headed our yeah, way. Yeah, yeah. COVID was a good example as well. Yeah. Uh, Rod Pyle, editor in chief at Astra. If you want to subscribe, uh, it's it's the official publication of the National Space Society. Go to space.nss.org, uh, and then if you want to hear Rod's podcast, you do that every Friday with Tarek. Uh, I know you know that, but I'm just reminding you in case you forget. You go <laughs> to yeah. twit, T-W-I-T dot TV slash T-W-I-S. Twit stands for This Week in Tech, so This Week in Space is TWIS. And uh, you can listen or wherever you ever get your uh, podcasts. Look for T-W-I-S, This Week in Space. All thanks to you, <sighs> Lisa. Thanks to you. I just uh, collect the money. <laughs> Not keep Fair me, enough. Not keeping me that That's busy. That's a good trade. Not really uh, <laughs> a full-time job. Leo Laporte, yeah. the tech guy. More calls right after this. <laughs> I just write the checks. Maybe I should say that. I don't even do that. I don't know either. I just <laughs> I just show up. You show up. Lisa points now, me in a direction. you work a lot. Lisa yeah. even said uh, Leo's just a, a working animal, you know? Oh, How wow. many hours a week of content? Not do you that put much. In? It's gone no, way it's down. Like it used to be a right? lot. Um, I only work four days a week, and I do on average yeah. four or five hours each of those four days. So it's more like twenty. It's not. That's it's not as much lot. as it used to be. It used to be more like thirty. That's a lot of airtime. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if I were if I were on the radio four days, five days a week, four hours a day, which most people don't do anymore, but that's about yeah. roughly the same. So it's that's a full time job. So 
I guess it's a lot of press. You know, that's what I think is easy for folks to forget. I mean, I was always kind of scared of radio, but when you look at what people like you and Bill Handel do, I mean, I just how many hours of prep does it take? I'm just, I just half ass it. I don't. <laughs> I just, don't tell anybody. I just show up and talk. Uh, no, I, uh, I do have producers for uh, the other shows, not this show, but for the other shows who put together yeah. a rundown. But that's based on, I'm, I, and Lisa will tell you this. I'm pretty much constantly going through feeds looking for stories so that's the yeah. prep you know readings keeping up on what's going on in tech someday i won't have to do that and i don't know what i'm gonna do with myself you're gonna be on a lifelong cruise somewhere <sighs> you know this morning i'm saying okay lisa now <laughs> we can build up your stamina <laughs> we'll start with a two-monther and we'll slowly <laughs> we'll slowly work our way up I think the last time I went on a cruise was probably six years ago. It was only a week, and I think I gained oh, seven pounds. You have to learn not to. It's tough. The last cruise we went on, which was right before COVID, yeah. there was a really good uh, Na Napoli's pizza place, stone oven, right outside our cabin, like oh. 10 feet from our cabin. <laughs> That I'll was, just go get a few slices, honey. Spacanopoli, it was called, and the guy was yeah. Naples. It was a, it was incredible, incredible, and yeah, it was that was a bad thing. That well, to my shame, thing. my my downfall was the twenty four hour little mini buffet with all the the junky stuff that you really don't want to eat, but no. you do just because it's there. Yeah, it's yeah, they have an ice cream station open and, all yeah, day. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. It's like, don't do that. To that's me. Not that's, good. that's not good for people with oh, weight. I've kind of, I've yeah, yeah. No, I'm pretty careful about because uh, it's tempting. The good news is you always have a lot of variety, so you can eat a salad yeah. if you want. And so that's not. You well, know, and chips forced. are big enough now. You can you can loop loop around the deck five or six times. It got a pretty. Well, Lisa makes me do in, that. So. We do the yeah. We go down to the yeah. gym, road every day, and then we hike at a rapid pace around the deck. <laughs> uh, with all, with there's a, you know usually yeah. on any cruise there's about five people who actually work out. Yeah. Well, and you're one of them. And, uh, so well, clearly, thanks to Lisa. She makes me. You are loved. Yes. <laughs> hey, Rod, a pleasure. Lisa keeps Thank saying you, every sir. time we go down, uh, she says, next time we go down south, we got to visit Rod's boat. Yeah. Yeah. Let's so do we'll it. let you know. We'll okay. let you know. Thanks, Take my friend. Take care. See ya. Bye. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for letting me do this. I don't know, you know, I must have been good in an early, earlier life or something because this is, a, this is a wonderful blessing. Thank you to Professor Laura, our musical director, who is always surprising me with her, the depth of her musical knowledge. Well done, Laura. Thanks to Kim Schaffer, the phone angel. She's the behind-the-scenes genius who gets everybody ready for their appearances on national radio. Thanks to all of you who call in. You are equal partners on this show. Without the calls, there is no show. And, of course, thanks to all of you who listen. Without you, uh, I don't know what I'd be doing. wouldn't be this. So thank you. I appreciate it. Leo Laporte, the tech guy. Time for a couple more calls before we wrap it up. Let's go to L.A. Jim's on the line. Hi, Jim. Hey, Leo. How are you doing? I'm wonderful. Welcome. How are you? Great, great. Got a question. Yes. I want a cheap camera to spy on my garden. Because I got some varmints trying to tear up my tomatoes. Oh man! <laughs> so a twenty dollar camera off Amazon. It keeps telling me the SD card can't be found. Oh. Does anything right to that, or do I get rid of the camera? Or do I well, uh, so it? it's one of these cameras that has a little micro SD card you put in there to record. Yep. And uh, the first thing I always do when I do this is f use the software. Does the camera have an app? Uh, it it had some IWF app or something. Okay. IWF camp. So app. go into the app and see if there is a way to format the memory card. Because okay. every every device ha might has different formats. You always want to format it. Whenever you put a memory card into any device, you want to use that device to format it. So try that first. Uh -huh. If it says, I can't see a card, then it, okay. it's possible that card is bad. So try another one. Okay. Good news is SD cards are cheap. If it's not the card, yeah, yeah. then it could be the device itself is bad. So it's never right good at all. So okay. yeah, but I would first try formatting it. Often that makes a big difference. Okay. All right. Okay. Cool. I'll do that. All right. Thanks for the call. I appreciate it. Uh, Jay next from uh, Manassas Park in Virginia. Is that where the battlefield, the Manassas battlefield, is? 
Yes, in fact, I'm just walking past a burial site here. Oh, that's wow. Off limits. You have to get a special permit to get on, go on it. Goodness gracious. Wow. Well, a pleasure to talk to you. What can I do for you, sir? Well, Leo, I'm glad to get a hold of you here today. I use the Outlook, which I have used for, I know, 25 years. And the last couple of months in the Outlook app on my computer, or if I go to Outlook.com, any email I get with attachments, which are good attachments that I want, but if I do a reply, a forward, or if another person that received that email also does a reply back to the sender, my attachments disappear. Yes. And that's a security thing. So it is a pain. But the reason Microsoft's doing this, their reasoning is attachments are the number one way viruses get onto a system. Now, of course... Anybody does business knows we use attachments. I'm telling my wife all the time, don't send attachments. I've been saying on this radio show almost as long as you've been using Outlook, don't send attachments. But we still do. We need to. So as long as you're sure those attachments are okay, then you are then you can forward them. But uh, there are limitations. For instance, uh, I believe now, uh, this is a security update that came out a while ago. I believe now, if it's still doing this, uh, that you might have to download that attachment and reattach it. So okay, It's very frustrating because if I get a, a, an email with an attachment, and yeah, I want this attachment, yeah. but I think, well, I don't need to download it. I just have it as a reference right. at some future point. But even if somebody comes in, like this person set out set this out to many people, if someone comes in and says, "Oh, thanks, Joe, for the email, the attachments," then uh, uh, Outlook puts it together uh, on my email, and the attachments disappear. Yeah. Now the only thing that has saved me is it doesn't happen on my phone. The Outlook app on my phone. I can always get to the attachments. Okay. But I can't on my computer, and so it's been very frustrating. But I, I can't go back and get to those attachments. <clears throat> uh, yeah, no, I understand. Um, generally, um, let me look and see here. Right-click on the okay. attachments, select, select all. Now your attachments will be selected. Right-click on them, select copy, hit reply in the email. Yeah, there's a workaround, but boy, is it a pain in the butt. Uh, I, I honestly think this is Microsoft trying to protect you from yourself. <laughs> but that's kind of annoying, yeah. especially if you're sure that this attachment is fine. Yeah, um, yeah. From a person we've been working together, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. a long time, and he's sending out attachments of information. I, and um, yeah, I think it's telling me. I'm just looking at Microsoft's various uh, tech notes on this <laughs> that you have to manually do this, uh, which is so you select the attachment, select copy or hit you know Control C to copy it, and then paste it in the reply. In other words, it no longer automatically sends attachments, which is incredibly frustrating. But again, I think that that's that's just there being secure but the part i'm frustrated with if i don't even do anything but something intercedes with that email then i can't even go back i try to go back yeah it's to gone email, yeah it's gone yeah. yeah um so it's something they have to, okay so at least i know it's something they are doing on purpose and not just me or my computer or something. No, no, no. I believe it is a uh, it is something Microsoft's doing for security. They've really changed how Outlook deals with attachments because it is the number one way viruses uh, get sent. Let me just look and, and see which version of Outlook are you using. Do you know how what, uh, what well, year? Well, I have it tied in. Well, I have three sixty five. You know, I'm yeah. So it's up to date. Okay. So it's the it's most recent. Together with that. Yeah. 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 I have Windows 11. I keep it up to date. I'm looking to the chat room, but none of them send attachments because they've been listening to me for years saying don't send attachments. 
Um, so you see the paperclip icon. You know you have an attachment. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and sometimes I'll see the email and see there's an attachment, and then I'll think, oh, you know, like a week later, I'll say, oh, I need to go back. And then it's gone. And check that, and it's gone. And, and in fact, even when it's gone, I still see the paperclip. And uh, now this this could be a separate issue, which is if you have multiple people on that thread, are there multiple? Like you're sending yeah. it to somebody, and somebody's sending it on, and somebody's sending it on, that kind of thing. Yeah, or other people receive it also, and when they reply, you know, there may be like 50 of us that get the email, and someone else will will, will reply and say, "Hey, thanks, Joe, for sending it." And and that goes into my email, you know. Yeah, unfortunately. And then it disappears for me also. I think you have to do it manually, um, which is to copy that attachment, paste it into the next email as you reply it. It's a lot easier, and I would encourage you and everybody doing this to use OneDrive. Put the file you're attaching in OneDrive and just send a link. That link will automatically be forwarded along and sent along, and then you're not sending files again and again and again, you know, junking up the Internet with many, many copies of the same thing. Put it somewhere. Put it on OneDrive. Everybody on Windows has OneDrive or somewhere like that, and share that link. That's generally what I recommend people do, and I guess that's what Microsoft wants you to do. That's my guess. I'll, have, I'll do some research. I'll look into it. Maybe we can talk about it next week. Jay, thank you for the call. Thanks to all of you for the calls. I hear the music that tells me it's time to wrap it up for the week. Have a great, safe, happy Geek Week. Enjoy the first day of May. I'll be back next time. Leo Laporte, The Tech Guy. Take care. Well, that's it for The Tech Guy Show for today. Thank you so much for being here. And don't forget, TWIT, T-W-I-T. It stands for This Week in Tech, and you'll find it at twit.tv, including the podcasts for this show. We talk about Windows on Windows Weekly, Macintosh on Mac Break Weekly, iPads, iPhones, Apple Watches on iOS Today, Security and Security Now. I mean, I can go on and on and on. And, of course, the big show every Sunday afternoon, This Week in Tech. You'll find it all at twit.tv. And I'll be back next week with another great Tech Guys show. Thanks for joining me. We'll see you next time.